I get home from work. It's almost midnight. The door opens and the home security system does that high-pitched beep 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 chime. I'm in my kitchen eating a late dinner before going to bed. I hear a door open and then the home security thing go beep beep beep, but it definitely sounded like it came from outside. I'm sitting right by the back door, so I go check the front door. The front door has a screen door and a wooden door that leads to a small entry room, then a second door inside that that leads up the stairs and into the house. These are loud old doors. I didn't hear the screen door open, and I didn't hear the main door close, but I also didn't hear the second door open. The door is just double locked and no other doors are opened. Nobody is standing outside. Okay, maybe it was the neighbor's door, and maybe they have the same system. I hear it again, and it sounds like it's coming from outside of the front of the house. I look out the window. It looks like there's a deer outside. It's crawling on the yard, with its belly on the ground. It decides to stand up and continues to stand up but on its back legs. The deer makes the beeping sound with its head raised up into the air. It's not a deer. It looks like a guy, but with deer legs. It's too dark to see what's really going on. I'm home. What the F? I'm home. The creature sounds like a dog is barking, but is trying to vomit at the same time. It starts to gallop away and across the street. Beep, beep, beep. What's weird about this is that I do not live in a rural area. The deer population typically stays down towards the outskirts of the city. I have never seen or heard anything like this. I'm 16 and I live in the backwoods of South Carolina. I've heard stories from the local kids of creepy things that happened in the forest about two miles away from my new home. I decided to go check it out because how scary can it really be? I grab a pistol and a knife as well as a flashlight and I head out into the dense forest. As I'm in the forest, it starts to get dark. I turn on my flashlight. A heavy fog all of a sudden rolls in bringing in a smell of copper and burnt hair. The hairs on the back of my neck start to stand on end. I start to hear this weird sound. It sounds like whispering and giggling. I hear something running around in the woods nearby. I hear it get louder and closer. I turn around to see something crawling extremely fast and low to the ground on all four legs. Whatever it was seemed to have arms and legs, like a human. I fire a shot right into its back, and I can see the blood splatter and a gunshot wound. It lets out a blood-curdling screech and retreats back into the woods. The fog lifts and the smell suddenly goes away. I nope my way out of there, all the way home. I get home and there it is, right in my driveway. It runs towards me and I shoot at it, but the bullets don't seem to fire. My gun was on safety. It jumps up and all I can see are its huge white eyes, and I black out. I wake up some time later on top of my dad's car, with my dad standing over me, trying to wake me up. My head hurts like nothing else and my ears are ringing. I tell my dad what had happened in the woods. And he just laughs and tells me, there's probably nothing. Life as I know it goes back to normal for about three hours. When? My dad says, hey Jake, mind getting me some of those steaks out of the fridge? I look at him and say, dad, my name's Nick, not Jake. He just looks at me like he's full of hatred. I just give him the steaks and he just goes into his room with them, uncooked. He comes out of his room about an hour later with only the packaging and throws them away. I don't even think about asking what had happened. 
At 11 p.m., he tells me to go to bed, which is odd, because it's Friday and he doesn't usually care when I stay up, but I do as I'm told and I go to my room. Around 3.15 in the morning, my door opens. It's my dad. I say nothing and pretend to be asleep. The smell of copper returns to the air and I feel sick to my stomach. My dad just sits on the edge of my bed and just looks at me for what I would say to be about 30 minutes. He then mumbles something under his breath with the voice I don't recognize. My blood turns cold and I just lay there. He finally gets up and leaves and I finally am relieved but I cannot sleep the whole night and just lay there in my bed. Finally the next morning I get up and I go out into the living room. My dad is asleep on his lazy boy recliner and his nose is bleeding. I wake him up and I tell him I'm spooked and I ask him about the blood. He has no idea where it came from. I ask him about the night before and he has no idea what I'm talking about and he doesn't remember waking me up from being on top of his car. My heart drops when he states that it was still Friday, when I know for a fact that it was definitely Saturday. He argues with me until I show him my phone with the day and time. At this point, we are both freaked out. I've never ventured out into the woods since then, and nothing strange has happened, except sometimes I will hear the front door open and shut a few times during the night. I was 16 when this story happened. I have family down in Alabama. They farm and own a huge amount of land down in Huntsville. My uncle owns a big house and a bunch of trailers that they put out in the woods for hunting and camping. Down south, my cousin suggests that we go out there to camp. They know I'm a city kid and they like to tease me about being from Chicago. We collect some food, kill a pig and some chickens, and bring the necessities to camp out in the woods for a few days. We get to the camp, and it's obvious that something is very wrong. The air has this weird electric smell, like right before a storm, like the ozone. We think nothing of it, and unpack and go down to the little creek to swim for a few hours. All of a sudden, some older white guy and a white teenager come out of the bushes, he has a shotgun in the crook of his arm and says hello and asks us what we're doing this far back into the land. We tell him about my uncle, who he knows, and say that we are out camping. He tells us to be real careful out here and stick together when there's a big animal out in the woods. His son, who is my age, asks if he can stay to hang out with us. He says okay. We end up just goofing around the whole day and we go back to camp, and we pull out some stuff for the campfire, even though the trailers both had kitchenettes. The crazy guy in the woods, son, Tanner, says that he wants to run home. His family's property sits up next to my uncle's, and asks if he can come out camping with us later. My cousin Rooster says that he's going to go with them since it's pretty dark, and one of the girls that is with us says that she's going to walk with them. It's about 7 o'clock right now, and it's starting to get pretty dark. They take flashlights with them and they take the trail towards Tanner's property. The rest of us just chill and make s'mores. About 30 or 40 minutes later, there's a smell of ozone again. You can smell it over the smell of the fire. It smells like this really nasty copper smell, like right after you had a nosebleed and it stopped. It wasn't exactly like dried blood. It was that nasty metallic back of your throat smell. We immediately think that it's some kind of electrical malfunction, or someone left a hot plate on or something. We search the trailers and nothing is on. All we can do is just smell that terrible smell. All of a sudden, we can hear these people booking down the path towards us. Tanner, my cousin, and one of the girls all come running into the clearing, out of breath, and they didn't even break stride. They all ran into the trailer right by where the fire was. We all immediately nope out of there and get into the trailers. 
They end up calming down and even my cousin is crying his eyes out at this point. All the while, the fire is getting lower and lower. So my other cousins say, F this, and go outside to go fix one of the generators out in the shed. My cousin says, no one's going outside, and locks the front door. Ain't nobody else is going out. He's been crying too hard and his eyes are bloodshot and puffy. His pants are so dirty. He tells us that they went up to Tanner's house and talked to his father to make sure that they could go camping with us. The father said to make sure to pack a rifle, just in case. Because a few days before, one of their pigs that they farmed was ripped up and eaten. They just assumed that it was one of the big cats or maybe a coyote. So they start walking back towards where we were camping. My cousin finally stops crying and shaking, and one of the girls that were with them says that they were starting to walk back when they got a really weird feeling. They then started to hear something in the forest. It was almost pitch black at this time, so they weren't sure at first what was going on. The girl says that she heard something in the bushes off to the trail on the right, and they all beamed their flashlights over there, and there was someone standing back in the woods in a little hollow. My cousin said that they shouted at him and told him that he was scaring people out in the woods and that he should not be out there. My cousin continues and says that they realized that the guy was facing away from them, so they keep walking and they start smelling that nasty coppery ozone smell and they say that they've looked off into the forest on the opposite side and it's just a dude standing in the forest backwards slightly closer to the path so they start walking back to our campsite and Tanner realizes that he accidentally left the rifle as they're telling the story the smell is super strong even inside the cabin they say that after they started walking faster, that a kind of low gibbering had started coming out from both sides of the woods, and they started booking it back to the trailer. The girl said that she flashed her flashlight out into the woods to the side of them, and that something jerking itself through the woods and the gibbering got louder and louder, and when they could finally see the light of our camp, something behind them started sprinting at them as hard as they could. The natural reaction was to run away as fast as they could and into the campsite. That brings us to now. So we're out in the woods, and we are assuming at this point that it's just some rednecks or something trying to mess with us. All of a sudden, my other cousin, Junior, starts going on about how he went to school with the native kid, that he was telling him about this goat man or something. We all collectively promptly tell him to shut up because we don't need anything spooky right now. But he just keeps going on and on about how it's this goat man, and how we're in the woods and blah blah blah. Now at the time, I've never heard of the goat man, or anything like that. But a couple of years ago, before I graduated from college, I've had a friend, or a roommate I should say, that was pretty well versed in the subject. To sum it up, it's basically the sky with the head of a goat, and he can shapeshift and get among groups of people to terrorize them. It's also supposed to be this kind of wendigo thing, kind of like a skinwalker. It's bad mojo to even talk about it, and even worse if you see it. Keep in mind, I didn't know this back when I was 16, so my cousin is going on about this goat man and how it's going to try to get us. The girls are all terrified, and my cousins and I are trying to figure out if it's just some hillbillies or if it's actually this weird shape-shifting animal. All of a sudden, the smell just goes away. Like to this day, I haven't even experienced anything like it. Like usually smells fade away or get less strong, but this just literally just goes away. After an hour or so, we stop crapping ourselves enough to go back outside and to stoke the fire up again. We figure it was just some a-holes trying to F with us out in the woods, and we decide not to go home. Because of this, we decide that it might be a good idea to make the fire nice and bright, to scare away any animals that it could have been. Nothing else weird happens that night, and we stay another night, and for the main part of the night, nothing happens. About one in the morning, we're outside getting drunk and telling ghost stories. As someone is finishing a spooky story, I don't remember what about, that smell comes back. And it is so strong like one of the strongest smells I've ever experienced. It's so strong in fact, that one of the girls literally starts vomiting. 
I stand up and you can actually feel how clammy the air is. I say that we should get inside. This isn't right. We should have just left when we could. We all go back inside and we're standing around and my cousin just keeps going on about how it's this goat man again. My cousin tries to shut him up. All this time I am feeling this weird feeling in my gut and I can't figure out what it is. We end up sitting in there for a while. The smell is just as strong and we're terrified. We're all huddled in this camper. We end up cooking brats for everyone because nobody wants to go outside. The brats are packed in a four pack and we have a total of three packs all together. I grill them up on the stove and everybody gets a hot dog. I get mine and after a while, one of my cousin gets up and goes over to the pot to get another. He starts grumbling about how do I get two and everyone else only gets one hot dog. I look at him like he's an idiot. I tell him that everyone got one because there's only 12 brats and everyone got one, thus 12 people. If he wanted more, he should have brought them. That's when one of the people with our group starts screaming, Oh my gosh, get out of the cabin now. Everyone starts crying and shivering, and it finally dawns on one of the cousins what is actually happening. Me and my cousin both glance around the room, and I feel my heart sink. We all run out of the cabin, and I begin counting. There's actually 11 of us all together. How was there 12 of us when we were inside? On this trip, we brought a lot of people with us. Some people we didn't know very well. Thus, it was kind of difficult to kind of keep track of who was who. We all finally calmed down, and we decide it's best that we all spend the night back inside the little camper that we have. Everyone spends the rest of the evening on their toes. I don't think many of us got any sleep that night. Did we actually stay in a room with a skinwalker and not know about it? That's really something I wish not to think about. This story happened a couple of years ago. It was me and my group of friends that we would go camping with quite often. It was our junior year and we had two weeks left before school started. We wanted to have fun and we decided to go camping deep out into the woods. During this time, me and my friends were kind of into survivalism. We wanted to go camping with the bare essentials. We only brought some food and some tools that we could build a shelter with, and a couple of sleeping bags. I also brought a tarp just in case if things didn't work out. We literally picked a random patch of woods to go camping in. We went early in the day and tried to set up camp. We found a couple of sticks and logs and tried to put them together to make a shelter. I'm actually quite impressed looking back on how well we did. It did take us about 4 or 5 hours to make a decent shelter for all 4 of us. I wouldn't recommend it. After spending most of the day building our shelter, we were pretty hungry. As we were eating, it was around 6 or 7 in the evening. We decided to tell some scary ghost stories to make things more fun. We told your basic ghost stories. Nothing too crazy. There was one that was kinda good, but wasn't that scary. As the night got later, and the fire got more dim, that's when the more interesting stories came out, and we started talking about skinwalkers. I had heard about them before, but I haven't heard about some of the additional information that I heard that night. Apparently, skinwalkers used to be people, and they kind of sold their soul to the devil or something. By doing so, this granted them powers, the ability to change from one shape to another mostly animals. I kind of had an idea about that, but this I didn't know. When you spoke, or even thought of the word skinwalker, it would draw their attention to you. Of course, me and my friends were skeptical about this idea. That's kind of silly, don't you think? Deep down though, something about that kind of terrified me. From that point on, I was kind of on edge that evening. As the fire was practically out, we'd realized that all the noise outside had suddenly stopped. All the wildlife, all the animals, stopped making their usual noises. Even the bugs that constantly bugged us during the evening had stopped making noise. Everyone, as if at once, ears kind of perked up into the air, searching for that sound, hoping for something normal to be happening. But deep down, we knew that it wasn't. Something was happening. It was bringing out this primitive nature of us that kind of put us on edge, as if there was a predator nearby. None of us said anything. We just listened to the crackling of the fire as it slowly 
faded into the night. As the fire got dimmer and dimmer, we could hear something getting slowly and slowly louder, as if it was approaching us from a far distance. This sound was accompanied by this horrible smell. It was as if there was rancid meat being hung from this dirty trash can that was blowing right into all of our faces. Being the tough guys that we were, and the idiots, we realized that none of us had packed a flashlight, kind of going with the theme of survivalism and having the bare essentials. There was definitely something in the woods making its way through the brush. Whatever the creature was, it didn't sound small. It could have maybe been a moose or something, but during this time of year was quite unlikely. All of us were quietly scanning the tree line, trying to see if we could see what it was that was stalking around our campsite. That's when I had this odd idea. I told all of my friends about what we heard earlier about the skinwalkers. I told them all to stop thinking about them, and that hopefully they would go away. Normally, my friends would have made fun of me for suggesting such a silly idea, but I think they were so scared that they had no choice but to agree with me. I then brought up a random conversation, anything to take our minds off of what was happening, and it seemed to be working. The sounds from around our campsite seemed to be going away, as did the smell. About 30 minutes later, it was as if all things were back to normal. The sounds of the forest came back to our ears, and we were pretty excited. I then made the suggestion that we should pack up and go back home, considering what was going on. It was about 1 in the morning, but it seemed like a better idea than staying out here for the rest of the night, especially with those creatures. I proposed the idea, and unanimously, my friends all agreed that we should have left a long, long time ago. One of the perks of not having much material when you go camping is that you don't have to pack up as much. We were packed up in about 15 minutes, all four of us, including putting out the fire. We were out of our campsite in record time, back onto our trail, hiking back to our cars. Unfortunately, this hike was about 20 minutes, and none of us had a flashlight. As we were hiking, I couldn't help but think what had happened earlier. That's when the smell came back. But not just the smell, the sounds of multiple creatures coming through the woods slowly approached our rear. There wasn't just one creature, there was at least three of them. My friends seemed to be catching on, and we tried to return back to our tactic of not thinking about it. But we were out in the woods with no light, being stalked by three skinwalkers. The task of not thinking about it was nearly impossible. We were about 10 minutes in when we started hearing what sounded like our friends being mimicked by a weird radio. The sound sounded staticky and it wasn't quite perfect impressions of our friends. The skinwalkers were mimicking what we had been saying all night, saying phrases that we had said that evening as if they'd been listening, trying to perfect what we say and how we say it. My friends wanted to stop and try to turn around and confront these creatures. I told them that, that that was not possible. We had to keep moving forward, or else. At this point, we start sprinting down this trail. We have no idea where we're going. It's pitch black, and the things behind us are now screeching and screaming. These terrible sounds. We finally go to where we think our cars are. By some miracle, we are able to find our way back to our cars. At this point, all of our gear has been dropped and we have nothing but our shoes and clothes on our backs. We all jump in my truck and thankfully it was a four-door. We're all inside and I turn on the car and my headlights are on, facing the woods that we just had exited. The sight that laid before us was terrifying. About 20 yards away from us, in the woods, stood three creatures. They were all about 8 feet tall. The creatures looked like a crossbreed between a moose and a wolf. All of them had very large antlers. Some of them were broken off. Some of them were stained red. But all of them had very, very large teeth. Their eyes were a piercing red, and it was as if they were glowing. But all of these features 
do not come remotely close to as to what was most terrifying about these creatures. They were all standing on their hind legs. My good friend moved in next door about six years ago. He's married and has three kids. I have two. Our families get along very well and we go on trips quite often. Sometimes we like to go camping out into the woods. That is the setting for this Skinwalker story. My friend's wife picked the location. She's part Navajo and thought it would be fun to go camping on the reservation. Unfortunately, that is exactly what we did. The area that she procured for us was pretty nice. It had a nice little flat area where we could put our tents up, but it was also surrounded by trees. This was nice because it felt like we had a sense of privacy within the trees. We were going to be there for three days, so we set up camp and had a good time. During the setup of camp, however, we let the kids run around and as long as they stayed within earshot, we didn't mind where they went. While putting the finishing touches on the rainfly for my tent, one of my kids returns back to campsite with bones. Thankfully, these were obviously not human bones, but that of a large animal, probably a cow or a horse. I told the kids that, that this is really gross and they shouldn't be playing with dead animal parts. They reluctantly agreed and went back to playing out in the woods while we finished putting the final touches on the campsite. We got a fire going and started cooking up dinner. The sun was beginning to set, but because of the trees nearby, it was already pretty dark where we were. About halfway through dinner, I began to feel this very weird sensation coming from the woods. I had this feeling that I needed to go to the woods, but I obviously didn't want to go. Something was telling me subconsciously that I needed to go in the woods and by myself. It was almost hypnotizing in a way. For some reason, my attention was drawn to a particular spot in the forest. I stood up and shined my flashlight in that direction. Obviously, nothing was there other than dense brush. This did catch everyone's attention, and they asked me what I was doing. I played it off how I saw a raccoon in the forest and wanted to see it better. Everyone thought this was amusing, except for my friend's wife, who was part Navajo. I could tell the way she looked at me, she knew I wasn't telling the truth. We then soon later finished our dinner and put more logs on the fire, since we were now immersed fully in the darkness of the night. I then began to develop a sense of unease coming from the forest. I felt as if there was a predator nearby, and my survival instincts tried to kick in, but my logical mind told me that I was just being paranoid and I had no true reason to feel unsafe. I was with people I knew and loved and my friend and I did bring means to protect ourselves from animals or anything else for that matter. I had my shotgun and my friend had his pistol that he normally carries with him. I had no true reason to feel unsafe, and yet, here I was. The group decides to tell ghost stories around the campfire, as we usually do on our camping trips. This is normally one of my favorite parts of the campout, but due to how I was feeling, I was already on edge and didn't really want to do this at this time. But I didn't want to ruin everyone's fun, so I kept quiet. During the stories, rather than listening to them, I tried to listen to the sounds of the forest all around us. The normal sounds of the wildlife at night was replaced by dead silence. This is never a good sign. About halfway through my friend's favorite ghost story, we all heard what sounded like a scream. This scream sounded like it came from pretty deep in the woods, but it was too close for comfort. I stood up with my flashlight in hand and recommended that me and my friend go investigate what that sound was. My wife was the first one to shoot down that idea. Yeah, right, and leave us all here by ourselves? Yeah, that was pretty stupid, I admitted. My wife's friend then told us about the forest nearby and how sometimes they could be haunted with spirits of the forest or even inhabited by skinwalkers. At this time, all the kids seemed to be on the verge of tears, so we recommended to do something more lighthearted. My friend grabbed his guitar from his truck and began to play songs. My friend was very average at playing the guitar, yet he thought he was the best. But this did help us switch from a scary situation to a more lighthearted one. And soon enough, we had all forgotten about the scream coming from the forest. We called it a night and everyone went to their tents to go to bed. Me and my friend stayed up and made sure that the fire went out. After 30 minutes of talking, the fire was now coals and the visibility was very low. 
I had that hypnotizing feeling coming again from the woods. Instead of seeing the dark empty forest, I was then greeted by the hideous sight of what looked like a horse. My unease was replaced by confusion. What was a horse doing in the middle of the woods? I got up to get a closer look, and the horse slowly receded back into the woods. Luckily, I had my flashlight on me, and I shined it on the animal. This horse was not normal. It looked very ill, and its limbs were almost bent at weird angles. It wasn't until I was practically in the woods until I got a good view of it. Not only did this horse appear to be ill, it almost looked like it was deceased in a way. Parts of flesh and bone were sticking out of parts of the animal that should not have been possible. My initial thought was maybe that this horse was a victim of a bear attack, or even a cougar. I turned back and went back to camp, and I told my friend what I had seen. He was very uneasy by what I just told him. He then gave me the weirdest advice. He told me to not think about it, not even to talk about it ever again, or at least still while we were out in the woods. I agreed and we went to bed. I was then awakened by my friend and his wife at 7 in the morning. We were told that we were no longer allowed to stay on the land and that we were not welcomed by the natives. I was frustrated and a little bit annoyed since my friend's wife was responsible for procuring the campsite for us to camp on. I got up and woke up my wife and my kids and told them to pack up and that we were cutting our camp trip short. They were just as annoyed as I was but as soon as we stepped out of our tent, our frustration was replaced by fear. What littered our campsite is what appeared to be bits and pieces of animals. Most of the pieces were on the ground while other pieces were hung up in trees, hanging off branches. The sight was pretty gruesome. It looked like a bomb had gone off and bits and pieces of meat were everywhere. I can honestly tell you that was the quickest my family has ever packed up our campsite. While packing up, I took a few seconds to look around and I looked at the footprints on the ground, maybe getting an idea of who had done this. The only thing that I could see were hoof prints. We were packed up and ready to leave and we took off from the campsite. The sun wasn't even out yet, so it was still kind of dark. While driving out of our campsite, I swear, despite the low visibility, I was able to make out a figure in the woods. And it wasn't that horse. It was something tall, something malevolent, something I'm glad we didn't stick around to see. We both get home after driving the long trip back to our houses. My wife agrees to cook everyone breakfast while I decide to put everything away. We were in such a hurry of packing that most of our stuff in the back was just thrown in there and not really organized at all. I'm about 15 minutes into putting things away when I pull up parts of the tent. As I pull it out of the trunk of the car, a white piece of material falls out and lands on the floor. I look down and I realize that we had accidentally packed a bone of one of the animals that was strewn about our campsite. It was just a creepy reminder of our experience. Nothing more. Or so I thought. It takes me another 30 more minutes and everything's finally packed and put away. I go back inside and I have my breakfast, or whatever was left over from everyone else. This is the part of the story where I wish this was the end and I could say happily ever after, but unfortunately, this is where everything began. I need to describe to you our street that we live on. Like I said, my friend and I are neighbors, but he lives across the street. But the road we live on is pretty secluded and has a lot of trees on it. Anyways, my friend and I decide to take our families into town and to spend the rest of the weekend in town doing fun things. The weekend went by faster than it normally does. That's probably because we had a great time. We return from the town after our failed camping trip. I pull into the driveway and, to my dismay, the front door to our house is off its hinges. I tell my family to wait over at my friend's house while I investigate the damage. The front door is off its hinges and in the bushes on our front yard. There are long scratch marks around the door handle and around the corners of the door. The door also has puncture marks which are pretty deep. My guess looks like it looked like it was a bear trying to enter our home. Maybe we left some food out or something and it tried to get in. The real question is, is the creature still in my home? After a brief search of the house with my trusty shotgun, I found nothing to conclude that the animal was still in our home. However, I did find paw marks along the house. The paw marks didn't lead to any area that contained food, including the kitchen or dining area. 
Instead, they led to my bedroom, almost directly, as if it went nowhere else, as if it knew exactly where to go and what it wanted to do. I inspected my bedroom, and to my horror, I found a couple of objects that were not there before. There was a small circle of bones in the center of my bedroom. What are the odds of a bear bringing in bones to my home and placing them accidentally in a circle in my room? This made some sense with my bear theory, but the other objects in my room did not. Inside the circle of bones was a bundle of twigs that were bound together by rope in the shape of a person. The bundle of twigs had feathers and other objects attached to it that looked very strange. Next to that was a burning candle. Whatever it was, whether it was a Navajo kid playing a prank on us or an actual skinwalker, I was pretty terrified. I was about to investigate the room further when I heard a scream come from across the street. Not just one scream, but many. I run outside with my shotgun in hand and I go across the street to meet my friend and my family. Before I can even cross the street, they all come running towards me pointing to the back of the house, telling me that it, it got her, it got her. Out of this moment of chaos and confusion, my friend somehow manages to scream to me that some creature grabbed his daughter and dragged her into the woods. My friend and I then go into the woods looking for the creature and his daughter. We are not even in the woods for five minutes when we see what looks like his daughter just standing in the middle of the woods. Her hair is disheveled and, and her limbs are bent at weird angles, much like the horse on our camping trip. I begin to feel very uncomfortable. My friend, being overwhelmed with emotion, runs over to what appears to be his daughter and picks her up. He then begins asking her, Are you okay, sweetie? Are you okay? What happened? The girl begins to give responses, but it sounds as if she had water in her lungs. It was very unusual considering we were in the middle of the woods. The child appears to be injured, but is giving no signs that she's actually hurt. As we're walking back, I start to begin to think that maybe this little girl that he's carrying isn't his daughter. We both emerge out of the woods and both families are elated that we finally found a daughter. We were only gone for about 15 minutes. But in lieu of everything that has happened, they were pretty terrified the whole time we were away. My friend finally sets down his daughter and I'm horrified at the sight of her. I was unable to get a good look at her while we were in the woods, but now that we are in good lighting, I could get a good look at her eyes. Her eyes were milky white, much like a blind person's eyes. I only note that because this girl is known for having very bright blue eyes. As the chaos is slowly settling and our families are finally getting a grip, I try to get my friend to talk with me in a lone private area. I try to tell him, hey man, something's wrong with your daughter. She doesn't look like herself. We talk for a few minutes, kind of heatedly, and we finally conclude that we will take her into the hospital in the morning. Just with everything that's been going on lately, both families felt like they needed a rest. Anyways, I am finally able to go back to my home and clean up the mess and finally bring my family over. I put a tarp over the doorway so we'll have something covering the front end of our house. I don't tell my family what I'd saw in the house earlier, and I don't tell them what I think what's going on with the daughter. This is something I felt maybe I should have done differently. My family and I finally turn in for the night, and we go to bed. We're pretty exhausted, so sleep comes pretty easily for us. My family and I get much needed sleep. I sleep in until about 10 and then I wake up and make my way over to my friend's house. I knock on his door. No answer. I call and text his phone. Also no answer. Hmm, that's pretty strange. Maybe they're at the hospital already and we're pretty busy. I spend the rest of the day just doing other things and not thinking about what had happened this last weekend. Sure enough, time passes and two days go by without my friend getting in contact with me. This is very unusual considering he and I and our families are very close. Now I thought about it, I actually haven't seen him or his family since he brought home that little girl that looked like his daughter. I told myself if I didn't see them in three days, I'd call the police. Just before that time, however, sure enough, my friend emerges from his home. Except something's different. Something's wrong. My friend's head is kind of at a weird angle. His neck looks bent and his limbs are kind of contorted in different directions. His eyes are milky white. He tells me that I should come over and bring the whole family over. We'll have a great time. 
He doesn't sound like himself. He sounds like he's speaking out of an old, staticky radio. I tell him, sure thing, let me just go grab my family, and I head back inside. During this time, I decide to call the police and report a missing persons. That thing was not my friend. It was something that is imitating him. Sure enough, the police come about two hours later and I fill out a report. During that time, the police decide to take the liberty to go investigate the house of my friend. While the police are investigating, more police cars show up, as well as a fire truck and an ambulance. The police didn't disclose any information until about two weeks later, where I found out that my friend's family had disappeared. They told me that the case was still ongoing since they didn't find any bodies, but they have found enough pieces to conclude that they're most likely dead. The official police reports say that my friend and his family were dragged off by a bear of some kind and eaten out in the woods, but something tells me deep down that that's not the case. In 1969, I was nine years old and I lived about a half mile down the road from an old church and cemetery. There were two other old homes there, but no one lived in them. There were strange things that happened quite often around where I lived back then. I remember one of the strange things that happened very well. My dad worked evenings from 3 p.m. till 11 p.m., just three miles down the road from our house. My mom and sister and I had just gone to bed when we started to hear a bumping sound on the back of the house. My sister and I ran from the bedroom we shared, in the back of the house, to the front of the house where my mother and father's bedroom was. My sister and I were scared, so my mother let us sleep with her until our father came home around 11pm that night. Their bedroom had two windows, side by side, on the front of the house, above the porch. You could see through the curtains at night, due to the streetlight out front. We were lying there after not hearing any more noises, when all of a sudden, we had heard something on the front porch. Mom saw it first, and sat up in bed. That made my sister and I notice her staring out the window. When we turned her gaze from our mom to the front window, we saw what looked like a very large dog on our front porch. It was walking to the front door upright on its back legs. When the creature reached the front door, it shook it violently. It was as tall as the door, and we could see it scratching at the screen door with its front paws. It remained there for what seemed like 15 minutes, but in reality, it was more like one or two. My mother didn't say a word. She just shushed us until it turned and walked about 10 feet to the steps on its back legs. Just before it reached the steps, it went back down on all four legs. My mother told us to go back to sleep, and we eventually did. I do not remember her telling my dad, but I do remember this well. It was six to six and a half feet tall, while standing upright on its hind legs. You could see its facial features, its ears, its snout, its head. Those features made it resemble a German Shepherd. I'm not entirely sure what I saw that night, but this I am sure of, is that I do not want to see that creature face to face. In October of 1972, my husband, our two babies, my brother, and I left Leavenworth, Kansas in our 1968 VW van on a camping trip to a recreational area in Arkansas called Beaver Lake. When we finally got there, we found a fairly remote campsite at the far end of the park. We wanted to be alone as the babies woke often during the night and needed to be fed. We didn't want to disturb any other campers. Shortly after pulling into our campsite, my brother pitched his tent next to the van. The rest of us were going to sleep in the van. Because of the many trees and thick brush, daylight had trouble poking into our camping spot. Fast forward to that night. Sometime around 3.30 a.m. I heard some animal sounds on the ridge that I thought were being made by coyotes. The babies were asleep and all was quiet otherwise. I peered out of the window but couldn't see what was making the sounds because it was so dark. Still hearing odd yips and howls, I laid back down on the back seat. Moments later, there was a huge crashing bang on the van wall right next to my head. My husband leapt up out of a full sleep. My brother bolted out of his tent and jumped into the van with us. We were all in a panic, looking in every direction, trying to see what had hit the van like that. 
My brother finally yelled that he saw something moving behind the van. We all turned just in time to see a large shadow moving about 20 feet behind the van, from left to right. After about 20 minutes had passed without any of us seeing movement out there, my husband and brother went out to inspect the van for damage. We then started hearing pounding steps coming from the brush about 50 feet behind us. The guys eased back into the front seat of the van. That's when my husband turned on the headlights and stepped on the brake pedal for rear lights. Instantly, there was a huge commotion. He started the engine and that's when, in the glow of the headlights, we could see a hairy thing 10 feet away and coming towards the van. As it got closer, its silver-tipped hairs glistened in the light. It had a grayish streak from its shoulders down to its back. The creature was walking on two legs and was around 7 or 8 feet tall, had a barrel chest, and had skinny legs. It never gave us a good view of its eyes though, so I couldn't tell you what they looked like. I could see the face of it, and it was not like an ape. It was dog-like. It had ears and tufts of fur on top of them and was very human-like in its movements and general body structure. It moved smoothly and quickly around to the back of the van, where it followed the base of the ridge away from us. That's when it let out a menacing huff and a low, rumbling growl, like a dog. Insanely, my husband and brother bolted from the van, trying to get a better look. That's when a shower of gravel came at my husband. My husband and brother tore back into the van and burned up the road getting us out of there. I kept looking out of the back window and they looked in the rearview mirrors, but none of us saw that creature ever again. I am a 24 year old male and I live in the middle of nowhere. I was getting home late one day after dropping my sister off at the airport in Lamar, Colorado. I live just under 7 miles north of the Oklahoma border on 250 acres of land. I have a trap line running around my property for coyotes. The first two traps I checked were empty, so I headed south. That's when I saw this thing. At first I thought it was a coyote, a big coyote. It was almost five feet tall on all fours. It was caught in my trap and was running around making a dust cloud, and then it stopped and looked at me. Now I'm used to a duke number three holding leg trap, so I could catch a variety of things in it. Anyways, I slammed on the brakes and my truck stalled because it was a manual. I was fumbling for the keys to start it. It's an old farm truck with the carburetor on it and it had quite an afterfire. Once the creature heard that, it lunged at me and roared. I saw that it had its hand, not a paw but hand, caught in my trap, right hand to be exact. It had probably been looking for a dead rabbit I had in the bait hole next to the trap. It then stood up and ripped the two earth anchors I had, 24 inches on the ground, right out. It took me a long time to put those things in there with a 10 pound hammer, but it pulled them straight out within 15 seconds. After it did that, it just stood there, looking at me. It felt like an eternity and I knew that my 357 would not do anything to stop this thing if it came at me. I prayed to God that it wouldn't come for me in my truck. I was looking at it in shock and awe and I noticed that it had orange eyes. They weren't glowing, instead they had quite a tint, kind of like cat's eyes in the dark. They may have been reflecting my headlights, but I wasn't sure. It then took a step towards me and curled its upper lip, showing me its teeth. The teeth were huge. The two longest ones appeared to be four to five inches long. It then growled at me, and in the blink of an eye, the creature was gone. I was scared crapless. I jammed the truck into gear and spun the tires out, trying to get out of there. Like I said earlier, it felt like an eternity, but it had lasted no more than 30 seconds. I returned later with my Native American friend. He is a part of Arapaho. I grew up with him and I trust him. He told me some stories that were passed down through his grandparents' tribe and mentioned something about a loup garou, or a French werewolf. He also told me about how fur trappers in the late 1700s were chased off the land in the Rockies from this thing. Having seen this creature, I do not blame the trappers for leaving. My encounter happened in February of 2009. In November of 2008, I broke my arm and was basically stranded at home. I was unable to drive or work and was going stark raving mad with boredom. My best friend would drive the 35 miles north of Palmetto to pick me up in Fayetteville just to take me back to Palmetto for a visit at her home. 
She'd take me to dinner or out to see a movie, only to deliver me back home. One night, she was driving me home. It was very late, well after 11 p.m. We were on the US 31 northbound, around the Rothbury area of Oceana County, on the expressway. Being in February in Michigan, the roads were naturally very snowy, with scattered patches of ice and bare pavement. There was a small pickup truck in front of us. It was about five car lengths away. All of the sudden, we saw something on two legs dart out from the left, just in front of an overpass. It ran across the two-lane highway and hit the back of the small pickup truck in the rear quarter panel, causing the pickup to fishtail. Luckily, the driver of the small pickup regained control, but didn't stop completely to see what collided with them. If anything, the pickup truck began to pick up speed, as if the driver had seen what had happened. My friend and I watched in utter astonishment as the creature finished running to the right and disappeared into the weeds and trees along the highway. It didn't even break stride after it hit the truck. We looked at one another and sat in silence for a moment, and then I said, Did you see that? She said, Yeah, I saw it. We finished the ride to my house in silence, both of us lost in our thoughts. It looked as if it was a giant dog or wolf. The creature was on its hind legs, not at all on its forelegs like a normal dog. It was at least seven feet tall. It had pointed ears and kind of a mane around its neck, much like a lion's. The mane was a dark color and its hind legs looked like a dog's legs, which was even more pronounced as it was running on only its hind legs. The creature's front legs were swinging freely as it ran, and it seemed to have its mouth open as if it had something in it. It had an elongated face, much like a collie's face, and a long nose protruding from its face. Its face was covered in this longish hair. The entire creature seemed to be covered in this long hair, but I cannot recall if it had a tail. Something tells me it did not, but I'm not really sure. We thought, perhaps, it may have been one of the Michigan dogmen that had been said to be in our area. Being a former Native American area, we have always heard stories about these creatures, but never thought we'd actually meet one firsthand. We always heard stories about the Michigan dogmen, but they were always stories from someone else who knew someone else that actually had the experience. It was never anyone I actually knew. Going forward, I hope this is my last experience with the creature. I get home from work. It's almost midnight. The door opens and the home security system does that high-pitched beep 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 chime. I'm in my kitchen eating a late dinner before going to bed. I hear a door open and then the home security thing go beep beep beep, but it definitely sounded like it came from outside. I'm sitting right by the back door, so I go check the front door. The front door has a screen door and a wooden door that leads to a small entry room, then a second door inside that that leads up the stairs and into the house. These are loud, old doors. I didn't hear the screen door open, and I didn't hear the main door close, but I also didn't hear the second door open. The door is just double locked and no other doors are opened. Nobody is standing outside. Okay, maybe it was the neighbor's door, and maybe they have the same system. I hear it again, and it sounds like it's coming from outside of the front of the house. I look out the window. It looks like there's a deer outside. It's crawling on the yard, with its belly on the ground. It decides to stand up and continues to stand up, but on its back legs. The deer makes the beeping sound with its head raised up into the air. It's not a deer. It looks like a guy, but with deer legs. It's too dark to see what's really going on. I'm home. What the F? I'm home. The creature sounds like a dog is barking, but is trying to vomit at the same time. It starts to gallop away and across the street. Beep, beep, beep. What's weird about this is that I do not live in a rural area. 
the deer population typically stays down towards the outskirts of the city. I have never seen or heard anything like this. I am 16 and I live in the backwoods of South Carolina. I've heard stories from the local kids of creepy things that happen in the forest about two miles away from my new home. I decided to go check it out because how scary can it really be? I grab a pistol and a knife as well as a flashlight and I head out into the dense forest. As I'm in the forest it starts to get dark. I turn on my flashlight. A heavy fog all of a sudden rolls in, bringing in a smell of copper and burnt hair. The hairs on the back of my neck start to stand on end. I start to hear this weird sound. It sounds like whispering and giggling. I hear something running around in the woods nearby. I hear it get louder and closer. I turn around and see something crawling extremely fast and low to the ground on all four legs. Whatever it was seemed to have arms and legs like a human. I fire a shot right into its back and I can see the blood splatter and the gunshot wound. It lets out a blood curdling screech and retreats back into the woods. The fog lifts and the smell suddenly goes away. I nope my way out of there all the way home. I get home and there it is right in my driveway. It runs towards me and I shoot at it, but the bullets don't seem to fire. My gun was on safety. It jumps up and all I can see are its huge white eyes, and I black out. I wake up some time later on top of my dad's car, with my dad standing over me, trying to wake me up. My head hurts like nothing else and my ears are ringing. I tell my dad what had happened in the woods. And he just laughs and tells me there's probably nothing. Life as I know it goes back to normal for about three hours when my dad says, Hey Jake, mind getting me some of those steaks out of the fridge? I look at him and say, Dad, my name's Nick, not Jake. He just looks at me like he's full of hatred. I just give him the steaks and he just goes into his room with them, uncooked. He comes out of his room about an hour later with only the packaging and throws them away. I don't even think about asking what had happened. At 11 p.m. he tells me to go to bed, which is odd because it's Friday and he doesn't usually care when I stay up, but I do as I'm told and I go to my room. Around 3.15 in the morning, my door opens. It's my dad. I say nothing and pretend to be asleep. The smell of copper returns to the air and I feel sick to my stomach. My dad just sits on the edge of my bed and just looks at me for what I would say to be about 30 minutes. He then mumbles something under his breath with a voice I don't recognize. My blood turns cold and I just lay there. He finally gets up and leaves, and I finally am relieved, but I cannot sleep the whole night and just lay there in my bed. Finally, the next morning, I get up and I go out into the living room. My dad is asleep on his lazy boy recliner, and his nose is bleeding. I wake him up and I tell him I'm spooked and I ask him about the blood. He has no idea where it came from. I ask him about the night before, and he has no idea what I am talking about, and he doesn't remember waking me up from being on top of his car. My heart drops when he states that it was still Friday, when I know for a fact that it was definitely Saturday. He argues with me until I show him my phone with the day and time. At this point we are both freaked out. I've never ventured out into the woods since then and nothing strange has happened, except sometimes I will hear the front door open and shut a few times during the night. I was 16 when this story happened. I have family down in Alabama. 
They farm and own a huge amount of land down in Huntsville. My uncle owns a big house and a bunch of trailers that they put out in the woods for hunting and camping. Down south, my cousins suggest that we go out there to camp. They know I'm a city kid and they like to tease me about being from Chicago. We collect some food, kill a pig and some chickens, and bring the necessities to camp out in the woods for a few days. We get to the camp and it's obvious that something is very wrong. The air has this weird electric smell, like right before a storm, like the ozone. We think nothing of it, and unpack and go down to the little creek to swim for a few hours. All of a sudden, some older white guy and a white teenager come out of the bushes. He has a shotgun in the crook of his arm, and says hello, and asks us what we're doing this far back into the land. We tell him about my uncle, who he knows, and say that we are out camping. He tells us to be real careful out here, and stick together when there's a big animal out in the woods. His son, who is my age, asks if he can stay to hang out with us. He says okay. We end up just goofing around the whole day, and we go back to camp, and we pull out some stuff for the campfire, even though the trailers both had kitchenettes. The crazy guy in the woods, son, Tanner, says that he wants to run home. His family's property sits up next to my uncle's, and asks if he can come out camping with us later. My cousin Rooster says that he's going to go with them since it's pretty dark, and one of the girls that is with us says that she's going to walk with them. It's about 7 o'clock right now, and it's starting to get pretty dark. They take flashlights with them, and they take the trail towards Tanner's property. The rest of us just chill and make s'mores. About 30 or 40 minutes later, there's a smell of ozone again. You can smell it over the smell of the fire. It smells like this really nasty copper smell, like right after you had a nosebleed and it stopped. It wasn't exactly like dried blood. It was that nasty metallic back of your throat smell. We immediately think that it's some kind of electrical malfunction, or someone left the hot plate on or something. We search the trailers and nothing is on. All we can do is just smell that terrible smell. All of a sudden, we can hear these people booking down the path towards us. Tanner, my cousin, and one of the girls all come running into the clearing, out of breath, and they didn't even break stride. They all ran into the trailer right by where the fire was. We all immediately nope out of there and get into the trailers. They end up coming down and even my cousin is crying his eyes out at this point. All the while, the fire is getting lower and lower. So my other cousins say, F this, and go outside to go fix one of the generators out in the shed. My cousin says, no one's going outside, and locks the front door. Ain't nobody else is going out. He's been crying too hard and his eyes are bloodshot and puffy. His pants are so dirty. He tells us that they went up to Tanner's house and talked to his father to make sure that they could go camping with us. The father said to make sure to pack a rifle, just in case. Because a few days before, one of their pigs that they farmed was ripped up and eaten. They just assumed that it was one of the big cats or maybe a coyote. So they start walking back towards where we were camping. My cousin finally stops crying and shaking, and one of the girls that were with them says that they are starting to walk back when they got a really weird feeling. They then started to hear something in the forest. It was almost pitch black at this time, so they weren't sure at first what was going on. The girl says that she heard something in the bushes off to the trail on the right, and they all beamed their flashlights over there, and there was someone standing back in the woods in a little hollow. My cousin said that they shouted at him and told him that he was scaring people out in the woods and that he should not be out there. My cousin continues and says that they realized that the guy was facing away from them, so they keep walking, and they start smelling that nasty coppery ozone smell. And they say that they've looked off into the forest on the opposite side, and it's just a dude standing in the forest, backwards slightly closer to the path. So they start walking back to our campsite, and Tanner realizes that he accidentally left the rifle. As they're telling the story, the smell is super strong, even inside the cabin. They say that after they started walking faster, 
that a kind of low gibbering had started coming out from both sides of the woods, and they started booking it back to the trailer. The girl said that she flashed her flashlight out into the woods to the side of them, and that something jerking itself through the woods and the gibbering got louder and louder. And when they could finally see the light of our camp, something behind them started sprinting at them as hard as they could. The natural reaction was to run away as fast as they could and into the campsite. That brings us to now. So we're out in the woods. And we are assuming at this point that it's just some rednecks or something trying to mess with us. All of a sudden, my other cousin, Junior, starts going on about how he went to school with the native kid. That he was telling him about this goat man or something. We all collectively promptly tell him to shut up because we don't need anything spooky right now. But he just keeps going on and on about how it's this goat man. And how we're in the woods and blah blah blah. Now at the time, I've never heard of the goat man or anything like that, but a couple of years ago, before I graduated from college, I've had a friend, or a roommate I should say, that was pretty well versed in the subject. To sum it up, it's basically this guy with the head of a goat, and he can shapeshift and get among groups of people to terrorize them. It's also supposed to be this kind of wendigo thing, kind of like a skinwalker. It's bad mojo to even talk about it, and even worse, if you see it. Keep in mind, I didn't know this back when I was 16, so my cousin is going on about this goat man and how it's going to try to get us. The girls are all terrified, and my cousins and I are trying to figure out if it's just some hillbillies or if it's actually this weird shape-shifting animal. All of a sudden, the smell just goes away. Like, to this day, I haven't even experienced anything like it. Like, usually smells fade away or get less strong, but this just literally just goes away. After an hour or so, we stop crapping ourselves enough to go back outside and to stoke the fire up again. We figure it was just some a-holes trying to F with us out in the woods, and we decide not to go home. Because of this, we decide that it might be a good idea to make the fire nice and bright, to scare away any animals that it could have been. Nothing else weird happens that night, and we stay another night, and for the main part of the night, nothing happens. About one in the morning, we're outside getting drunk and telling ghost stories. As someone is finishing a spooky story, I don't remember what about, that smell comes back. And it is so strong, like one of the strongest smells I've ever experienced. It's so strong in fact, that one of the girls literally starts vomiting. I stand up and you can actually feel how clammy the air is. I say that we should get inside, this isn't right, we should have just left when we could. We all go back inside and we're standing around, and my cousin just keeps going on about how it's this goat man again. My cousin tries to shut him up. All this time I am feeling this weird feeling in my gut, and I can't figure out what it is. We end up sitting in there for a while. The smell is just as strong and we're terrified. We're all huddled in this camper. We end up cooking broths for everyone because nobody wants to go outside. The broths are packed in a four pack and we have a total of three packs all together. I grill them up on the stove and everybody gets a hot dog. I get mine and after a while, one of my cousin gets up and goes over to the pot to get another. He starts grumbling about how do I get two and everyone else only gets one hot dog. I look at him like he's an idiot. I tell him that everyone got one because there's only 12 broths and everyone got one, thus 12 people. If he wanted more, he should have brought them. That's when one of the people with our group starts screaming, Oh my gosh, get out of the cabin now. Everyone starts crying and shivering, and it finally dawns on one of the cousins what is actually happening. Me and my cousin both glance around the room, and I feel my heart sink. We all run out of the cabin, and I begin counting. There's actually 11 of us all together. How was there 12 of us when we were inside? On this trip, we brought a lot of people with us. Some people we didn't know very well. Thus, it was kind of difficult to kind of keep track of who was who. We all finally calmed down, and we decide it's best that we all spend the night back inside the little camper that we have. Everyone spends the rest of the evening on their toes. I don't think many of us got any sleep that night. Did we actually stay in a room with a skinwalker and not know about it? That's really something I wish not to think about. 
This story happened a couple of years ago. It was me and my group of friends that we would go camping with quite often. It was our junior year and we had two weeks left before school started. We wanted to have fun and we decided to go camping deep out into the woods. During this time, me and my friends were kind of into survivalism. We wanted to go camping with the bare essentials. We only brought some food and some tools that we could build a shelter with, and a couple of sleeping bags. I also brought a tarp just in case if things didn't work out. We literally picked a random patch of woods to go camping in. We went early in the day and tried to set up camp. We found a couple of sticks and logs and tried to put them together to make a shelter. I'm actually quite impressed looking back on how well we did. It did take us about 4 or 5 hours to make a decent shelter for all 4 of us. I wouldn't recommend it. After spending most of the day building our shelter, we were pretty hungry. As we were eating, it was around 6 or 7 in the evening, we decided to tell some scary ghost stories to make things more fun. We told your basic ghost stories, nothing too crazy. There was one that was kinda good, but wasn't that scary. As the night got later, and the fire got more dim, that's when the more interesting stories came out, and we started talking about skinwalkers. I had heard about them before, but I haven't heard about some of the additional information that I heard that night. Apparently, skinwalkers used to be people, and they kind of sold their soul to the devil or something. By doing so, this granted them powers, the ability to change from one shape to another, mostly animals. I kind of had an idea about that, but this I didn't know. When you spoke, or even thought of the word skinwalker, it would draw their attention to you. Of course, me and my friends were skeptical about this idea. That's kind of silly, don't you think? Deep down though, something about that kind of terrified me. From that point on, I was kind of on edge that evening. As the fire was practically out, we'd realized that all the noise outside had suddenly stopped. All the wildlife, all the animals, stopped making their usual noises. Even the bugs that constantly bugged us during the evening had stopped making noise. Everyone, as if at once, ears kind of perked up into the air, searching for that sound, hoping for something normal to be happening. But deep down, we knew that it wasn't. Something was happening. It was bringing out this primitive nature of us that kind of put us on edge, as if there was a predator nearby. None of us said anything. We just listened to the crackling of the fire as it slowly faded into the night. As the fire got dimmer and dimmer, we could hear something getting slowly and slowly louder, as if it was approaching us from a far distance. This sound was accompanied by this horrible smell. It was as if there was rancid meat being hung from this dirty trash can that was blowing right into all of our faces. Being the tough guys that we were, and the idiots, we realized that none of us had packed a flashlight kind of going with the theme of survivalism and having the bare essentials. There was definitely something in the woods making its way through the brush. Whatever the creature was, it didn't sound small. It could have maybe been a moose or something, but during this time of year was quite unlikely. All of us were quietly scanning the tree line, trying to see if we could see what it was that was stalking around our campsite. That's when I had this odd idea. I told all of my friends about what we heard earlier about the skinwalkers. I told them all to stop thinking about them, and that hopefully they would go away. Normally, my friends would have made fun of me for suggesting such a silly idea, but I think they were so scared that they had no choice but to agree with me. I then brought up a random conversation, anything to take our minds off of what was happening, and it seemed to be working. The sounds from around our campsite seemed to be going away, as did the smell. About 30 minutes later, it was as if all things were back to normal. The sounds of the forest came back to our ears, and we were pretty excited. I then made the suggestion that we should pack up and go back home, considering what was going on. It was about 1 in the morning, but it seemed like a better idea than staying out here for the rest of the night, especially with those creatures. I proposed the idea, and unanimously, my friends all agreed that we should have left a long, long time ago. 
One of the perks of not having much material when you go camping is that you don't have to pack up as much. We were packed up in about 15 minutes, all four of us, including putting out the fire. We were out of our campsite in record time, back onto our trail, hiking back to our cars. Unfortunately, this hike was about 20 minutes, and none of us had a flashlight. As we were hiking, I couldn't help but think what had happened earlier. That's when the smell came back. But not just the smell. The sounds of multiple creatures coming through the woods slowly approached our rear. There wasn't just one creature. There was at least three of them. My friends seemed to be catching on, and we tried to return back to our tactic of not thinking about it. But we were out in the woods with no light, being stalked by three skinwalkers. The task of not thinking about it was nearly impossible. We were about 10 minutes in when we started hearing what sounded like our friends being mimicked by a weird radio. The sound sounded staticky and it wasn't quite perfect impressions of our friends. The skinwalkers were mimicking what we had been saying all night, saying phrases that we had said that evening as if they'd been listening, trying to perfect what we say and how we say it. My friends wanted to stop and try to turn around and confront these creatures. I told them that, that that was not possible. We had to keep moving forward, or else. At this point, we start sprinting down this trail. We have no idea where we're going. It's pitch black, and the things behind us are now screeching and screaming. These terrible sounds. We finally go to where we think our cars are. By some miracle, we were able to find our way back to our cars. At this point, all of our gear has been dropped and we have nothing but our shoes and clothes on our backs. We all jump in my truck and thankfully it was a four-door. We're all inside and I turn on the car and my headlights are on, facing the woods that we just had exited. The sight that laid before us was terrifying. About 20 yards away from us, in the woods, stood three creatures. They were all about eight feet tall. The creatures looked like a crossbreed between a moose and a wolf. All of them had very large antlers. Some of them were broken off. Some of them were stained red. But all of them had very, very large teeth. Their eyes were a piercing red, and it was as if they were glowing. But all of these features do not come remotely close to as to what was most terrifying about these creatures. They were all standing on their hind legs. I was spending a month with my cousins at my grandma's house. It was August and my cousins' ages ranged from 10 to 15. I was the oldest, being 15 at the time. I was staying with a 10, 13, 14 year old, and we stayed up all night telling ghost stories very often. But one night, a few weeks in, we decided to make a campfire. My grandmother's house is in a rural suburb. The neighbors aren't too far when you are driving down the road to her house, but in the backyard, it is a thick forest with a man-made path through it. Each house is on a hill, so only part of the basement was actually underground. It was maybe 11 at night, and we were playing truth or dare after telling scary stories. My one cousin dared me, and another cousin, to go walk through the woods for 10 minutes. I said yes right away, as I wasn't easily scared and rather level-headed, but my younger cousin was a bit more hesitant. We didn't bring a flashlight because it wasn't pitch dark, thus we entered the woods with only the moon lighting our way. We were walking through the path for about five minutes and could barely see the fire through the trees when we decided to turn around. In the middle of the path, there was a large dog-like creature hunched over with its front hands an inch from the ground. The body of the creature looked like a dog's, but its head, hands, and feet appeared to be human. It looked right at us, and I know I was paralyzed with fear as it dashed away into the opposite 
part of the woods. Eventually, my cousin and I made it back to the campfire, screaming the entire way. I don't really remember much after that because I was really disoriented and I couldn't think properly. But what I do remember was waking up in bed, so I assumed that I was brought into the house. All the kids slept in the basement in a big room with a sliding glass door facing to the outside. I woke up the next day and I went outside with my cousins to find that both of my grandmother's dogs had been killed. It looked as if a bear had ripped them up the night previous. That night, we didn't tell stories, and we didn't stay up late. We were already too afraid. Instead, we decided that we would go to bed early. But I remember waking up at 2 or so in the morning because I felt something hit my head. I looked around the room to find all of my cousins huddled in the corner. As I was starting to get up, one of them pointed their finger at the glass door. I turned around and saw that the glass door had a really messed up face pressed against it. It had big wide eyes that seemed like endless pits of blackness. I screamed so loud and I bolted. My grandmother called the police and I told her what happened, but they found nothing. I went home after that and I'd never been there during the night ever again. I was in Kentucky for four or five days and spent the night at my cousin's home. Of the grandchildren who were there, I was the youngest and ended up babysitting duty for the majority of the time I was there. I stayed in a little trailer at the top of a little hill along with a bunch of my younger cousins. During the day, everyone would go to my granddad's and leave me there with the kids and then come home for a few hours to put their kids to bed before heading back out to do whatever. The last night I was there, I stayed up pretty late. The kids were in bed and I had a place to myself for a few hours before I had to go back home. I went out and sat on the porch and I walked out to find this awful smell. The smell was very similar to what I refer to as smelted metal. I started gagging and walked down the stairs of the trailer thinking I would get some fresh air off the porch. As I got down, I saw in the moonlight what looked to be one of my younger cousins, Aiden. He was just standing there with his back to me a good 50 feet away from the trailer. I yelled out to the little kid that he needed to go back inside, where his mother would have his hide, but he just kept standing there. I kept hollering and walked up to him, and as I got closer, I noticed he seemed kind of off. He was standing, but he had his knees bent in a weird angle, and his head was cocked to one of the sides. I tapped him on the shoulder, and he turned around. Aiden had this crazy, maniac smile on his face. He started to shake, and it took me a moment to realize that he was laughing, but no sound was coming out. I tried to pick him up and carry him inside so I could look at him in some decent light and make sure that he was okay. But he must have backstepped as I tried to get him. I snatched at him and I caught him and he just started to scream this really guttural voice I didn't think he could make. It was just too deep and gruff for a five-year-old to make. While he was screaming, he was also flailing his arms and legs. He ended up making contact with my groin, so I dropped him and he ran off towards the trailer. I sat there hunched over for a moment getting some air before running after him. He was gone when I looked up, so I ran inside, hoping he would have been waiting there for me in the living room. He wasn't, but after some searching around, I found him passed out in the top bunk of his bed. I was so confused, but I wasn't going to wake him up. I decided just to let him sleep and let his mom know what had happened. When she came home, I told her what had happened and she woke up Aiden to ask why he was acting that way. 
Aiden had no clue what we were talking about, and we ended up sending him back to bed. His mom thinks that I must have had a crazy vivid dream and I made it all up. But the next morning, while I was packing up my stuff into the truck, I smelled that smell again. And I swore I saw Aiden darting underneath the trailer. I was about to follow him to see what he was doing when he walked out of the front door a split second later with the rest of his family. I just told myself that I was imagining things and I didn't say anything to my family. I live in northern Washington near a ton of woods and one day me and three of my friends Aaron, Jake, and Kyle made plans to go camping in the woods since we all loved the outdoors and just wanted to get away from it all. My friend Jake knew these woods the best and said that he had a great spot for us to go camping. So we all got our stuff and headed into the woods. It took us two hours to get to the spot, which was perfect, and we got our stuff set up. After we set up our stuff, we ate and decided that we wanted to go exploring, with Jake leading the way. Everything was going great. We were going to go a lot further than I've ever gone in these woods, and eventually we made it to a clearing. That's when Jake started to act different. I didn't really think anything at first. I just blew it off as him being weird. As we walked across the clearing, I saw a grayish human thing walk into the woods on the far side. But again, I just blew it off since I didn't want to get them riled up for no reason. We were about three-fourths of the way across this clearing when we saw a mutilated deer laying there. When I say mutilated, I mean it was cut clean in half with its head completely missing and parts of its skin ripped clean off. What made everyone so uneasy was the fact that there were no flies around this carcass at all and it was still warm. I instantly thought to that thing I saw in the woods and told them about it. Aaron said he saw it too, but he thought he was seeing things also. I then got the unshakable feeling that I was being watched, and I could see that everyone else was creeped out. We all decided to go back to camp, and since it was getting late, we decided that we would go to the clearing some other time. That's when I heard the sound of someone running up really fast. I turned around and there was nothing there. I tell my friends that we should hurry and leave because I don't want to go out anymore. They agreed, and we started jogging through the woods with the sun setting. We didn't think that we would be in the woods for so long, so no one brought a flashlight, and it was getting dark fast. About 20 minutes into our jog back to camp, we hear a blood-curdling scream coming no less than 50 meters away. At this point, we are running through the woods, and it is getting darker every minute. That's when we hear a weird growl off to the side of us, rustling and twigs snapping. I'm terrified at this point, and we are all sprinting through the woods back to this site. We finally make it back and tear into our tent with all of us hyperventilating. None of us say anything for about five minutes, when Jake says, let's get out of here. Right after he says that, we hear a Let's get out of here Right outside of the tent. Everyone is beyond terrified at this point. We have no idea what to do. We sit there in complete silence and we hear two sets of footsteps going around our campsite, throwing our stuff around. One of the things even tries to open the tent, but I hold the zipper down with all the force I can muster. Literally everyone is crying at this point. Eventually, those things leave, but we are too scared to even go near the door. About three hours of trying to figure out what just happened, Jake decides he is going to check outside to make sure the coast is clear so we can get out of here. I decide to go with him since I didn't want him to get killed. When he opened the door, we stepped out. He shined the flashlight into the woods, 
and we saw three of those things staring right back at us. Their eyes were huge and sunken in, but also pitch black. They were about six feet tall and lanky. When they noticed that we saw them, they ran faster than anything I've ever seen run into the forest. Jake and I booked it back to the tent and told Kyle and Aaron what just happened. Aaron became hysterical and came up with a brilliant idea to run back to get to the car and get out of there. I tried to stop him, but he was going to run on pure fear and booked it into the woods. We had no choice but to go looking for him since those things were probably still out there. As we were grabbing our flashlights, we hear him scream in the distance, followed by a loud growl. We ran out of the tent and began searching for him, and spent the next 20 minutes looking. Kyle begs us to go back to the campsite, since we kept hearing something walking in the woods really close behind us. We get back to the campsite to find Aaron standing facing towards the tent, his back towards us. Jake starts to cry and says, What were you thinking? You're so stupid. Aaron then robotically turns and says, Haha, don't worry guys, I'm fine. We all look at each other, but we decide to get back into the tent for safety. Jake says that it's best for us just to wait it out over the night and leave in the morning. I then notice bruises and cuts all on Aaron's arms and legs, and when I asked him about it, he only said, Haha, don't worry guys, I'm fine. Aaron kept saying that the exact same way. We all just tried to ignore him and get through the night alive. The rest of the night we heard those things walking around our campsite, and Aaron kept asking if we wanted to go back out there for some stupid reason. Like, hey, I saw the sweet rock back out in the woods. You want to go see it? After an eternity, morning came and the noises stopped. We all began sprinting to the car when about 20 minutes in, I noticed Aaron wasn't to be seen. Since my other friends were still running, I didn't want to fall behind and I kept moving. We finally made it back to the car and we all agreed that Aaron was probably gone. We sped home and swore to never talk about this to anyone ever again. We told Aaron's mom that he walked off in the middle of the night and we couldn't find him. We were investigated about six months on and on, but they couldn't find any proof or motive that we would have wanted to kill him. We tried helping with the search, but nothing came of it. To this day, late at night, when I hear anything off in the woods, I think of Aaron. A mate I grew up with, this aboriginal bloke, we were camping and I went out for a pee in the dark night. We were way inland, behind some rock hills. Tall dead cane grass was everywhere and we couldn't see very far. After I relieved myself, I heard my mate calling me, but it was away from the camp. It was strange as I had just left him in the camp. I waited. He called again, no mistaking his voice. I called back and started walking out towards him. This went on for a little while, sometimes changing directions, calling me deeper and deeper into the woods. Suddenly, someone grabs me and I leap out of my skin and spin around. I have already realized I have walked deep into the cane grass and I am disoriented. My poor sphincter had taken a bite out of my shorts. It was a very somber face, my mate's face deadly, serious. I'm thrown into confusion. I'm a little bit angry. What are you doing? You were out in front of me. How did you get behind me? He says, it isn't me. We stand still. It's completely silent. I'm starting to get mad, but I can see his fear in his face. I wait. Sure enough, his voice calls again. Now I'm freaked out. I'm all wide-eyed and staring at him. He whispers, bad spirit. We'll go back to the camp straight away. If I knew where the effing camp was, I would have ran straight up his back to get there. At the camp, he tells me of how, for eons, that this had happened to his people. They get called away with familiar voices. Sometimes they make it back and tell them what happened, and sometimes they're young and they perish. 
I know what I experienced, so there's no denying it, but I always console myself with the explanation that it was some type of mimicking bird. If he hadn't heard me out there, and come track me down, well, who knows what would have happened. I was 15 at the time, and roughly the same age of my cousins and brother at the time. We were all within one year of each other. We go into the woods to be manly and do whatever guys do. We have normal supplies, axe, hatchet, knives, matches, you name it. It's getting late in the woods and we're extra manly since we were 15, but we decided to head back because the bugs are kind of too much. On our way back, there's a pretty androgynous looking person on our trail, just standing there with torn clothes. Hey, are you lost? We can lead you out if you want. This person starts doing this dry heaving motion like they were dry heaving but lifting their elbows too. Very unnatural looking. I say to the person, what are you doing? Whatever it was stops heaving. It opens its mouth and lets out this scream. It's unlike anything I've ever heard before. Normally, I would have ran away, but there was about 15 of us and we all had small weapons. We just stand our ground and lift our weapons up in defense mode. The thing cricks its head unnaturally towards us like they do in almost every possessed movie and smiles at us. We all scream to get away from us and sure enough, whatever it was did. Once the creature was out of our sight, we instantly stopped hearing any of the noises that came from it. It was as if it was still hiding behind a tree, waiting for anyone to come around looking for it. At this point, however, we were pretty spooked and we decided to get out of there. It was about three weeks until I finally went back into the woods. My wife asks me to go camping. I hate the idea, but she's pretty excited. Sure, why not? We drive to a secluded bit of land by her grandparents' house. We spend hours setting up the tent in the campsite. We get ready and go hiking. As we are hiking, however, it rains a little bit and we get a bit wet. We double back and get back just in time before it gets dark. We make a fire and the wife is getting a little bit tired, kind of low energy. We eat dinner and talk for a while, then we decide it's time to go to bed. We inflate our air mattress and get our double sleeping bag out. We get in together and she's shivering. I ask her, is she okay? And she says that she's fine. She keeps shivering and I don't feel good about this. You said you were fine. I don't want to ruin our trip or anything, but I think we should go back. I feel her face, and it's pretty hot. Well, it won't be any fun if you don't feel well tomorrow. I think it'd be better if we just leave. You might have a fever. She agrees, and we head back to our home. As we decide to get our things packed up, I put her in the car to wait. As I finish putting the tent and other odds and ends back into the car, I turn the car on and place her inside. I turn the heat on high so she can get warm. I go back into the tent and start to deflate the air mattress when I hear the horn beeping from outside. I run out over to the car and my wife says that there was someone around in our campsite. She said that they were crawling. She said that as soon as she saw them and was sure it was a person, she made sure to beep the horn to notify me. I can tell she's pretty upset about this. I didn't believe her at the time considering the state that she was in. I tell her to relax and rest up as I finish up packing. I gather everything outside the tent and step back in to roll up the mattress. I hear her yell my name. It sounded like it came from the woods. Why is she outside of the car? I then hear her yell, help me, my leg is bleeding. I rush out and I glance over to the car, but she's still inside, asleep. A wave of fear washes over me and I hear something yell again from the woods. This time, it doesn't sound anything like my wife. Help me. I begin to freak out, and instead of packing up the tent properly, I just roll it up as best I can and shove it into the car. I left a few unimportant items behind, considering I was in a rush, and I didn't want to meet whatever it was out in the woods. I start driving, and we finally make it home. When my wife finally wakes up, I ask her, what did you see out in the woods? She gets really serious and looks very stern in her face. She said that it was very white and thought it was a naked person crawling behind some trees. 
She then saw them stand up against the tree and began to beep the horn to get my attention. Then, whatever it was, got down on all fours again and took off crawling into the woods. In a way, I'm kind of glad that my wife got sick so that we would not be outside any longer with that thing. This one time, I was hunting these coyotes out in a cornfield. This was during the night. I am hunting over this gut pile of some kind of jack lidded deer. I shoot two coyotes and I leave them there. Half an hour passes and nothing. Suddenly, silence. Complete silence. No birds, no bugs, no anything. Crunch, scrape, crunch, tearing noise. What the F? Cloud goes over the moon. Complete darkness, like you can't even see your own hand darkness. The moon comes back. Something silvery, very low to the ground and about eight feet long, gnawing on dead coyotes by the gut pile. I assume it's a pair of coyotes that had laid down to dine. It explains the length. Night vision sucks at distance, so I couldn't exactly tell what I was looking at. I bring my rifle to my shoulder and sight approximately where the hip would be on this coyote. I was shooting .243 ballistic tip, more than enough to ruin a coyote's day, even with the hip shot. I fire. Crack! It just kinda stands up. It only gains like 6 inches in height, but can now clearly see that it has 4 legs. Its eyes, oh my gosh, its eyes were blood red and huge, like bigger than a coyote's entire head. I begin to unload in this creature. I watch as the rounds impact in a puff of dust and hair. The creature just saunters off like I'd hit it with a cork gun. I continue firing until I'm out of ammo and the creature is out of my sight. I tactically maneuver myself back to my truck and grab my AR with 8 mags. I also had a huge battery spotlight. I tactically work my way back to where I was. I use my 1 million candle powered spotlight and search around. Blood and fur everywhere. The dead coyote is bent and clean in half, like one bite. The fur is bright red, and I notice that there's a blood trail. But unlike the fur, this blood is black. I take a Walmart receipt from my pocket and dab it in the blood to test to see if it's still black. And it sure is. I frantically shine my light all over the wood line. The light immediately falls upon the face and eyes of that thing. It's just sitting there, watching. Sitting like a dog, but it's six feet tall. The thing is leaning on an old fence post, like a human. Its fur was bright red. I then proceed to mag dump my AR into this thing. It appears completely unconcerned, even though it's now black and bloodied. I then nope my way back to my truck and haul it back to town. I get to my game warden and he goes back with me at first light, armed for a bear. The coyotes and deer are now reduced to a clean white bone. The bone still has skeleton positioning. No predator eats like that. No predator is that clean. Sure enough, we find the blood and fur of the creature from the night before. Game Warden takes a sample and puts it in an evidence bag. We go home. We're informed immediately upon returning of the DNA of the creature. I know for a fact that I had beaten the Game Warden home. It would not have been possible to get back the results before I would have gotten back. The evidence says that it was a bobcat. If things weren't fishy enough, my state hadn't had a bobcat sighting since the 30s. I called the game warden as soon as I heard the news, and I told him that I wasn't buying it. He told me sternly to drop the subject. What was it that I saw in that cornfield that night? And why did the government want no one to know about it? Back in 2012, we always had bonfires every night. I'm in the Marine Corps Reserve, so while I'm at home, I work as an Ohio State Trooper. Anyways, a bunch of my buddies and I were having a bonfire. We got everyone at my house around 7 p.m., then loaded them up into our vehicles. Mine was a Chevy Suburban, and the others were a Jeep Wrangler and a Ford 350. The spot where we have our bonfires was a mile back on my land. There was this dirt path we would take to get to this cabin. 
It starts going out in between two fields, then through the woods, then dead ends at our cabin, which overlooks this creek. We had about 24 people packed into these three vehicles. We set off driving through the woods, and for my Chevy, it's no big deal. But as soon as we got to the area, I stepped out of my vehicle, and I could smell this awful smell. Death. It smelt like death, like an animal or something was rotting in the woods somewhere nearby. Everyone else said that they could smell too. I didn't think much of it at the time. Maybe a deer had died or something. This story took place near the end of September, so hunting season had just started. I started the fire and didn't think too much of the smell. We all eventually got used to it. We played beer pong and had a generator going to power the cabin. So my friend of mine, Ryan, had been telling me that this girl I had brought with me kept asking stuff about me to him, saying how much of a gentleman I was and how that we were probably going to hook up that night. Anyways, the fire was dying down, so Ryan was going to get wood with a few buddies of mine. I had them take a radio with them to radio me if they needed any help. The fire started to get real low, it had been about 30 minutes since they had left. Hey, where are your fruitcakes at? I asked over the radio. Dude, chill, I'm on my way, Ryan responded. They came back later with a ton of wood, got the fire going again, and eventually it started to get late. People wanted to start going home, so after everyone left, there were only eight of us that had remained. The girl I liked, Sarah, Ryan, David, another guy, and three other girls. David, the other guy, and the girls were wasted, and they were flirting all night. I continued to chill at the fire with Sarah and Ryan talking about some random stuff. It started to get real late, around 2am, and when the three girls, David and the other guy, wanted to lay down in the cabin, Sarah and I stayed outside and talked for a while. Eventually, we started to make out. I stopped when I heard this crackling sound outside. I looked over and I couldn't make out what the figure was walking around near the tree line. Hey you, what are you doing over there? I asked. Do chill, I'm on my way, the figure responded. It sounded exactly like Ryan, but I swore that Ryan had been in the cabin this whole time. Maybe he had walked out when I was occupied and didn't see him when he went out. What? I asked. Do chill, I'm on my way, it responded again. My hair started to raise up on my neck. What the heck? Sarah responded. Sarah, go inside and wake everyone up, I responded. She didn't hesitate. I walked over to my SUV and popped the trunk and grabbed my AR-15. For some reason I was shaking and the death smell was back again. What the heck? I whispered to myself. Shoving the mag into the rifle and sending a round into the chamber. I walked around the SUV to where I saw the figure in the woods and I couldn't see it. About this time Ryan had walked out of the cabin and looked at me like I was a stupid. Dude why do you have a gun? He asked. Were you out in the woods? I asked him. He told me that he'd just woken up and had no idea what I was talking about. I told him to take everyone back to their cars and come back with a gun. He got everyone into their SUVs and drove off. I sat there by the fire for a while, looking around. I had my spotlight with me at my side, the one million candle watt powered one. I couldn't help but think that there was someone in the woods trying to play a trick on me, but living 8 miles away from a prison, you can't really be too sure. The death smell was starting to get almost repugnant. I almost felt like gagging. I had something walking around in the woods again and I grabbed my spotlight and stood up. I waited for a moment then I saw it again. The figure walked out of the woods and stood there looking at me. I flipped on the light and pointed it at it. Whatever this thing was, its back was facing me, and it was facing the forest. Hey, I got a gun. You might want to tell me what you're doing in my land before I lay you out right now. Not a single word came from this person's mouth. I started to walk closer, and I heard the words, Dude, why do you have a gun? come from this person. Well, because I... I stopped mid-sentence. I started to think about what it just said. It sounded just like Ryan. It was as if it was mimicking him, but perfectly. It repeated it again, and this time it sounded exactly like Ryan. I raised my rifle and sighted it in on the sky. Ryan? I asked. The neck shifted a little bit and twitched its whole body. It looked unnatural. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but something about it looked 
wrong. I heard music playing in the background, and I could see headlights coming through the woods. Who are you? I asked. The figure turned around and looked at me. Its facial features were off. It looked like the other guy that was with Ryan, but its voice sounded exactly like Ryan. And it stared at me with its mouth wide open. Who are you? I shouted, flipping off my rifle safety. Something on the fire snapped and made a loud noise, so I flipped around to see what was behind me. When I looked back to the woods, the person was gone. Frick, I shouted, looking around for him. About this time, Ryan was parking the Suburban and getting out, putting a pistol in his back waistband. Dude, what's going on? He asked. I started to fill him in on everything, then asked if everyone was with him. He told me that everyone was in the cabin was in the SUV, the other guy, Sarah, and the three girls. We sat by the fire and started waiting. The death smell had went away for the time being. It was around 4 a.m. now, and the sunlight should be coming through just in a couple of hours. At that time, however, the death smell came back, this time stronger than ever, to the point Ryan gagged and almost threw up. I got up and looked around, waiting to see the figure again. A few moments passed and I could see something on the ground, coming out of the woods. I turned on my spotlight and shined it at the figure. The man, who I had seen before, was on the ground, rolling around. What the F is that? Ryan asked, pulling his pistol out from his back waistband. We both stared at the man rolling around for a good 20 minutes, then stopped and lay there on the ground. The man then started to twitch. I started walking towards the man, having my rifle pointed at him the entire time. I got about 30 meters away and he stopped twitching. He stood up and looked at me. All of the sudden, I had felt this feeling of absolute dread. I felt like everything I knew about my life was about to come to an end. I then took action and fired one bullet into the man's forehead. The man drops like a bag of rocks on the ground and starts twitching. What happened next, I cannot explain. The man stood up and started walking to the woods like nothing had happened. I lowered my rifle and watched as he made it into the tree line and turned around and looked at us. Maybe I'd missed, I thought. I didn't see any wound on him and nothing on his face was touched. When the man left, the death smell went away. I couldn't smell it anymore. The man smiled at us and walked into the woods again. By that time, we ran and got into the SUV, got in and took off towards my home. We never spoke of what happened to anyone in fear that they think we were mental. I've been back to that place countless times, but I cannot seem to forget that smell of death or that feeling of dread. I'm not sure if it was the goat man or a skinwalker, a ghost maybe? or a Wendigo, but whatever it was, I sure hope that it went somewhere else. We've never spoken about this particular event, not even among ourselves, after it happened. It was with my friends Ben and Ryan, and myself going camping into the woods like we used to do when we got a weekend off, or at least used to do, before this. In general, we try to go to new places. There was this one forest in particular situated two hours away from our city that we've been told about. We've been putting it off for a while because it was said to be dangerous, packed with wild animals that would attack campers often. Ben, in his usual part of trying to be a badass, said he would take out his shotgun and we'd be safe. Ryan was a bit of a wimp, but he agreed, so we drove there as soon as we were able to when we had a free weekend. We got there by mid-afternoon. After we set up camp and the night was beginning to set in, we decided to go out for a walk. We secured our stuff and Ben took out his shotgun, in case any animals approached us, and we started following a small path that got deeper into the woods. Walks in the dark like these would always relax me, but this time I was starting to feel uneasy. Something was off. About half an hour of walking, we started to hear noises getting closer to us. They sounded like footsteps of several big creatures closing in on us, but to this day I swear I could also hear soft whispers beneath the noises. Feeling like cornered animals, in total panic, we began running back through the path that we had come on. During this, I somehow lost Ben and Ryan, and we could not even see their flashlights in the distance. I kept on, running crapless. At some point, I ran past an old house, which seemed to have suffered a fire. The windows were boarded up, but the door seemed to be half open. 
Suddenly, I heard something coming from inside. Terrified at first, I froze, but then I realized it was actually Ryan, calling for me to come inside. I was doubtful at first, for some reason, but as soon as I heard the animal sounds coming closer to me, I bolted into the house and closed the door. I lifted my flashlight to look around, and there was Ryan. I pointed the light to his eyes, but he didn't seem to react much to it. In fact, he seemed really calm, which was odd for him. Let's stay here for now, he said, in a relaxed tone of voice. Those things out there could be dangerous. Now, I was worried about Ben, but remember that, worst case scenario, he had a shotgun, ready if anything attacked him. I took a deep breath and started looking around the room. The few chairs that were laying on the floor looked charred, and in one corner of the room, there was a pile of sticks with a bunch of stones scattered around them. All of the sudden, we hear Ben's gun go off twice. I stood there paralyzed, as every other sound in the forest stopped. I glanced briefly at Ryan, and he was just looking at me, completely quiet. I was about to say something when suddenly someone started banging on the door. Ryan immediately grabbed my shoulders and said, Don't open that door. It could be one of those things. I started walking towards the door and he insisted, Don't do it. They're gonna kill us. This really unsettled me, but I was afraid it could be Ben, who had just shot one of those wild animals and was looking for shelter. I grabbed on the metal door handle, took a deep breath, and as Ryan was still talking behind me, I opened the door. A cold chill ran down my spine. Standing there in front of me was Ryan. It didn't sink in at first as he was saying, Hey man, did you hear Ben's gun go off too? I think we needed to find him and get the hell out of there. I babbled something incomprehensible and slowly turned around, pointing my flashlight all over the room. Nobody was there. When the light reached the corner of the room, I realized what I had been looking at earlier. It was a pile of bones, and around them, forming a circle, were a bunch of skulls. Human skulls. We ran off as fast as we could, and found Ben near the campsite. When he saw us, he was pale, and did not say a word. We got in my truck and drove off, and we left the place, leaving all of our stuff behind. On the way back, after a long silence, I asked Ben what he shot at. Some of those things came from behind in the trees and attacked me. I shot them down. Ben, what were those things? It... it was you guys. I killed you both back there. The rest of the way back, nobody spoke a word. We never saw Ben again. It was the last summer that we all had together. We, being me, and a small group of my friends from high school. There was me, my boyfriend, and four of our mutual friends. So things didn't get confusing, I'm going to name my boyfriend, Lee, and my four friends, Allie, Harris, Landon, and Kathy. It was originally me and my boyfriend's plan, just the two of us going up to his parents' summer house in a nice rural area. Our friends got wind of it and decided to join in since it sounded like fun. It would also be one of the last times we would be able to meet together as a friend group. The summer home was very pretty. It was very rustic. It had these big open windows lining all the walls, so during the daytime, lights were not necessary. There were no electronics, but the entertainment wasn't an issue because there was this awesome lake not too far from the place. And of course, we also had each other. We made sure everyone had a few days free from work and whatnot. We took off and we packed up all of our big comfy pillows and blankets, as well as some stuff for s'mores and hot dogs. We took our good friend Harry's rig up. It was this clunker van and it had a lot of room in it, so that's why we took it. It had rained the day before and the dirt driveway leading to the summer home was all muddy. So we decided just to leave the car and carry all of our stuff up to the house. Once we got inside, we pretty much just dumped all of our stuff on the floor of the living room. We wanted to get down to the lake while the water was still warm. The sun was going to set soon and we wanted as much time in the lake as possible. There wasn't a lot of people there, it was just two old guys with their kids fishing on a boat. Everyone was in the water at one point, except for Harris and Landon, who were just chilling on the dock. We were all just having fun fighting over inflatable rafts and whatnot, when Landon yelled, Hey, there's someone over there in the woods. I propped myself up on the raft and saw what appeared to be a half-naked guy standing in the woods a little ways away from us. I can't really remember facial features, but I do remember his eyes. 
They were very dark and glittery, like they reminded me of a fox or something. From what I remember, he was very tan and had black hair. He was obviously an aboriginal. Most of all though, I remember his eyes. They seemed to shine. Kind of like those pictures when you see of animals and their eyes glow from the camera flash. I assumed he was a swimmer, maybe with the old guys who were already there early. I yelled at him and asked if he wanted to join us, but he just stood there, stiffly. He didn't move. It would almost be like he didn't even notice us if it wasn't for the fact that he was staring right at us. I remember Lee yelling at him if he was okay, but he still didn't answer. Harris is a big guy, a big irritable guy. He shouted at the guy to stop standing in the woods like a pervert. The guy still didn't react. He just stood there with only beige shorts on. Lee thought maybe he was on drugs or something. He got really uncomfortable and suggested that we leave. I agreed fully. The guy was really creeping us all out. We all clambered out of the lake and wrapped ourselves up in these towels and headed our way back to the cabin. The trail back to the summer house was uphill and gave us a good vantage point of the guy. He was still standing down by the lake, still stiff and awkward looking, except for his head. His head was turned as far as it could be to the side watching us. Landon is pretty skittish and he started to curse at us and telling us to go faster. Harris said that he was probably just retarded or something, and that if he attacked, that he could take him. We all went inside the summer house, under the guise of wanting to organize our stuff that we dumped on the floor, but I think we just didn't want to go outside again while that guy was still out there poking around. We do all we can inside, and it starts to get dark out. Allie volunteers to go outside with Landon to go dig a fire pit. Harris tags along and Lee says that he's going out into the woods to get some dead branches and stuff and that I would go with them. Kathy said that she'd go looking for kindling, but I think she was still kind of freaked out. Anyway, me and Lee were out in the woods. He's getting firewood and some sticks to roast the food on. I'm stuck carrying the wood since he's the one cutting it up. The mosquitoes are eating us alive and all I hear is this buzzing, but the buzzing keeps getting louder and louder until it feels like my skull is vibrating. I can't see and my teeth are chattering. Eventually it gets so bad that I drop the firewood and swat around my head. But that does nothing, so I just put my hands over my ears, but it feels like my hands are shaking too. It's then that I notice that I lost sight of Lee. I shout out to him and as soon as the shout leaves my lips, I'm overcome with this violent stench. I can't even begin to describe it. It was so rancid and foul. I put my hands over my nose. It took all of my willpower to not hurl. I started to head back to the house when I catch something out of the corner of my eye. It's Lee. I feel really relieved to see him and start to walk towards him, about to make a joke about how he tried to ditch me, but he doesn't really react. He just stands there stiffly without any real emotion in his face. His face is slack, like he'd forgotten how to smile or to make any emotion for that matter. His posture isn't relaxed like usual, He's very tense, like all of his muscles had cramps in them. My smile drops from my face and he lets out this wheezing gasping noise. His shoulders convulse up and down. It seems like he's trying to laugh but it only comes out as a strange mockery. I felt so terrified. I turned on my heels and it seemed all of my time on the track team finally paid off. I was running and jumping over branches and the buzzing returned, joined by the frail wheezing noise. I burst out of the tree line and bumped directly into Kathy, after what felt like an eternity. I remember she said, whoa, what happened? But I was panting and shaking too much to answer. She brought me over to the campfire, which was started, and sat me next to Lee. He put his arms around my waist and started to pick the twigs out of my hair. What happened? He asked. I looked at him, confused and angry. What do you mean? You left me in the woods. He seems perplexed. He then explains that he saw me clear as day heading back towards the house, and he followed me back wondering what was going on. When he got back, he said he didn't see me anywhere and the others didn't see me leave the woods. They were just going to look for me when I burst through the tree line after apparently running a marathon. What happened anyway? asked Landon. Did you see a bear? I wasn't sure if I was going crazy or not, but I was sure that I saw Lee. Now that I was back to relative safety, I began to doubt myself but I told them anyway. I told them about the buzzing and how I thought I saw Lee. 
Allie said maybe I was just tired and Harris agreed, mumbling something about mumbo jumbo. We decided to try to relax and make some s'mores. It was pretty dark by this time and the atmosphere seemed more lighthearted. We were all reminiscing about the old times and getting sticky from marshmallow goo. Landon took out his harmonica and started doing this funny old blues guy impression that he does. I was content and just laying there on Lee's lap listening to everyone's banter, just kind of zoned out when Landon stopped playing his harmonica. Everyone looked at him expectantly. No matter how tired everyone was, we could all depend on Landon to be goofy, but now he was just sitting still as a statue, peering into the woods. Guys, I think there's a coyote or a fox or something in there. Lee is this country guy and is used to these little critters like that, so he seems unmoved. He told Landon that it's probably just the smell from the food and that it would be easy to chase them off. Yeah, but this one looked big. Its eyes are high off the ground, I think. I feel myself tense up and look back into the woods. Lee snaps at Landon, telling Landon that he isn't funny and that he's trying to scare me. I tell him that it's okay, but I ask Landon to stop. Landon looks at me and swears that he isn't kidding, with no trace of his usual smart-ass smirk. He says maybe we should go inside in case it has rabies or something. We leave the fire going and go inside the house, intending to go outside again after a while. There are a few couches in the living room which face out of a big window towards our fire, so we all sit there to keep an eye on it. Harris growls at Landon that he better not be messing around, but Landon swears up and down that he isn't. We sit around for a while and our feeling of lightheartedness is gone. The fire starts to burn low when we see it. Kathy lets out this nervous squeak and a gasp. Eyes! Two glowing eyes can be seen in the woods. The lights of the fire make them burn bright. Slowly, a shadowy figure makes its way out and towards the campfire. As it steps into the light, we notice it's the aboriginal man from before. He moves forward slowly like a wolf circling its prey and crouches down by the fire. On closer inspection, we notice that he has no shoes on and what we thought were his beige shorts were actually some kind of skin-wrapped loincloth around his waist. I hear Harris mutter, Are you serious? And I feel Lee's sweaty hands slide into my own. Allie whispers timidly, He could be mentally ill. To which Landon replies, Holy hell. The man paws around our stuff and goes to where Landon was sitting. I see the man reach for something on the ground, and his movements seem robotic-like, like he doesn't know how to extend his arms properly. I see something glint in his hands, and my first thought was, oh my gosh, is that a knife? But then I hear a long, high-pitched note of a harmonica. Landon makes a weird gulping noise, like he wants to laugh and cry at the same time. The man blows into the harmonica again, holding the same high-pitched note for about 20 seconds or so. He makes a few more circles around the campfire, his dark eyes still glowing. He stops for a moment and looks into the windows. He stands there for a good five seconds before heading back into the woods. Okay, what is this guy's deal? Landon asks. Allie repeats that he could have some mental illness, but is now met by silence. Kathy looks extra nervous and has her knees pulled up into her chin, and she's shivering. I ask if she's okay. She starts to rub her eyes and her cheeks turn pink, like they always do right before she's about to cry. I'm sorry guys, you know, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned it earlier. I saw that guy earlier when we were walking up the driveway, but I didn't mention it. I didn't know, I, I didn't know. She breaks off into tears and repeats her mantra of I didn't know. Harris pats her awkwardly on the head and tells her that she doesn't need to apologize for not assuming every half-naked guy in the woods is a creep. She shakes her head viciously and begins to ramble about some old Navajo legend and some weird beliefs. She tells us how she's scared and thinking of how her mother would tell her these stories of these unigloshes. Allie told her to be quiet and that she was only scaring herself. Lee goes through his bag and gives her this bottle of water. He covers her with this feathery blanket and tells her that she's okay. The fire is nearly burned out and we decide that we won't be going out anymore that night. Harris and Lee go outside to grab our flashlights and the things that we left out in a hurry to get indoors. We pull all the cushions off the couches, which apparently double as beds. 
I'm in one bed with Lee beside me and Landon is on the other side with Allie and Kathy. The sleeping arrangements are a bit more cramped than we intended, but we did not want to separate. I guess I fell asleep at some point because a loud clap of thunder woke me up. It was raining pretty hard now. The rain was coming down sideways like a thick sheet. Hey, is anyone awake? I whispered, but no reply. There was a flash of thunder, and I can make out Allie and Kathy and Harris sleeping forms. Lee has his arm around me and I pull up the blanket over my shoulders and snuggle closer to him. Another flash of lightning and I see it. Those two green yellow orbs lit up in the darkness, standing right at the huge ground level window. The house goes dark again, but the light of those orbs are burnt into my retinas. And it seems everywhere I look for a couple of seconds, the orbs are there. Another flash of lightning and I see the man walking along the side of the window. It goes dark again, then bright. He's now outside the window, at my feet. I nudge Lee awake and tell him not to move. That the man is circling the house and that he shushes me and kisses my ear and the lightning flashes again. The man has made a full circle and is to my left again. I think he's trying to get a rise out of us, Lee whispers. I asked him what we think we should do. Stay still, I guess, and if he gets in, I'll have my buck knife under my pillow. Landon shifts besides us groggily and moans. Keep it down, lovebirds. I'm trying to sleep. I tell Landon that he's an idiot and that the man is outside, and he groans. Landon and Lee have their eyes shut, I think. Mine are open to slits and the room lights up again. That's when I noticed it. This guy is inside. I guess Landon didn't have his eyes shut because he screamed at the same time as I did. Lee sits up, holding his buck knife. Listen, we don't want any trouble. Just leave us alone. Don't do anything crazy. The man is moving slowly forward, eyes glittering in the darkness. Lee stays still, unable to see in the darkness. The man opens and closes his mouth a couple of times in a choking growl, saying, Trouble, trouble. His voice doesn't sound right. It gives me this sick, sinking feeling inside. It sounds like a scratchy record, maybe a parrot or something. The room lights up again and the man is nowhere to be seen. Harris and the others are sitting up now, bewildered. Lee is on his feet, pulling at his shirt. This guy's in here, I know it. He brandishes his knife around. We need to leave. My eyes are starting to adjust and I see the shape of Allie tilt her head. It's dark and we can't see anything out there, and it's pouring like crazy. Harris is now on his feet, reaching around in the darkness for a flashlight. I think he's the one that needs to leave, he growls, and makes his way to the kitchen, hatchet in hand. Lee follows closely behind, and noticing that they all took weapons, the rest of us follow. Kathy is sticking to me like glue. This is what it wants, she mutters. It's a game. We checked the house upstairs, every room, every closet. We didn't find anything. We all returned to the living room after that, trying to decide what to do. It's going to be morning soon, Harris says. We'll leave as soon as we see the sun come out. I didn't want to stay there any longer, but blundering down the long, muddy driveway in the darkness was not an attractive idea either. We all settled back in. I think we all got scattered sleep except for Lee, who sat up the whole night keeping watch. Every time I drifted off, I found myself jolting awake again. Eventually, the sun rose and outside was a bright and pink skyline that was beautiful. We hurriedly shove our crap into our bags. My bladder felt like it was going to burst and everyone else went outside. I asked Kathy to come to the side of the house with me so I could pee, because I was not going back in the house. She still looked a bit traumatized, her dark skin looking pale. She hugged her own shoulders. I squatted down to pee by the house and told her not to look. She didn't reply, but I didn't expect her to. I finished and stood back up and I told her to come with me. She stood still, her arms crossed, looking at the ground. I started towards the others, peering around the corner. Kathy was sitting with the others, sitting on the stairs. I felt a sinking feeling in my stomach and I turned around to see Kathy's doppelganger, her arms wrapped around her shoulders, shuddering. She lifted her upper lip in a weird sort of smile and sighed heavily. Mouth opening and closing, her breath hit me and I smelled it. It was a repugnant scent from before. 
I choked and she backed away slowly towards the tree line, staring into my eyes, not blinking. She choked out the words, come on, but halfway through saying that, her voice changed into what sounded like a fox, and she vanished off into the underbrush. I live in Arizona and I went camping with some friends in the Sedona area. One of the friends that I'm camping with has speech issues and they have some rotatism issues. They're not able to say their R's very well. Anyway, we went camping in this remote area. We were able to set up camp near this river since it is before mosquito season. My friend that has rotatism issues is a quiet type and just sort of falls into the background. Don't see much of him and everyone goes running around exploring and swimming. It gets dark and things settle down. Rotatism guy is still not around, but no one is too worried. He is a grown man after all and he can take care of himself, and it's not even that late either. Rotatism guy finally shows up, takes a seat by the campfire, and stares blankly into it. I ask him, is he okay? And he says, yes. I ask him where he was and he doesn't say anything. He had always been kind of aloof and quiet, so I just let it go. He's back and safe and that's all that matters. I start having fun again with my other friends, and I forget about the rotatism guy. He just sort of slips into the background as always. I go to bed and rotatism guy and the few others stay up. It felt good going to bed, but I couldn't fall asleep. I got more and more restless and drifted in and out of consciousness. I kinda have to piss and thought maybe it would help me sleep. I get out of the tent and rotatism guy is still in the exact same spot. I am barely able to see him from the burned down coals. I nearly crapped myself. It was pretty creepy. I can't really describe it. He was just sitting there, completely still and just looking at the coals. He rubs his hands together and puts them near the fire pit, like he was trying to warm them with a big fire. Not sure what to do really. He turns and looks at me. Finally, I decide to say something. Maybe something freaked him out and he was just desperate to talk to someone. Maybe he saw a dead body or something and is now in a catatonic state. I start to calm down. Are you okay? It's like 4 a.m. Suddenly he stands up and starts talking. He seems to act cheery but can't seem to put enough emotion behind it. He begins to babble on for a few moments about the sun coming up soon and it's good that we are able to get a good hike before having to leave. He wants to go on a hike with me, like right that second. He doesn't want anyone else to come with us and even know that we're going. He doesn't even want me to change clothes or put on shoes. He gets more and more persistent. Suddenly I realize that he's pronouncing his words perfectly. The rhoticism guy can speak perfectly for the first time in his life and has not messed up a single word since coming back from the woods. I then start to freak out. I say that I'm going to wake up the others. I go towards their tents and rattle them and yell at the friends to wake up. I make sure to never take my eyes off the rhoticism guy. He just sits down and returns to his pose, just staring at the coals. Most of my friends get up, pretty pissed at me, obviously, but I don't really care about that. I say anything needed to keep them up and to stay around me. One guy complains that it's cold and talks about getting firewood. The rhoticism guy offers to join him. Oh, I don't think so, I think to myself. I don't really know what to do in this situation. Should I out the rhoticism guy and expose him as a windigo or a flesh gate? Should I let my friend just go off and be taken by this guy? Like the retard that I am, instead of exposing this guy as the skinwalker, I decide to join them. The rhoticism guy stares at me for a moment. Might have been a glare, might have been a calculating stare. Either way, I know that I just saved my friend's life. The rhoticism guy follows us, slowly, like really creepily slow. Like it doesn't even fit with us. I make sure to stay by my friend's side and to keep an eye on the rhoticism guy. My friend kind of gets the idea that something's up. He starts looking back and notices the rhoticism guy too. We get the firewood, we get back, and I never take my eyes off of him. My friend does the same. He seems to get that rhoticism guy is also acting weird, just staring blankly. Doesn't talk unless he's spoken to. We'll do out of place actions, like he'll kneel down and put his shoelaces around like he's pretending to tie them. When we got back, I noticed that all the others went back to sleep because it was still pretty early in the morning. People start to wake up a couple hours later and no one notices but me and my friend that the guy is acting very weird. He will randomly talk to others trying to get them to go off into the woods alone with him. Thankfully, no one does since he was so weird about it. 
There's one example where the rodenticism guy asked someone else if they wanted to go pee with him out in the woods. That's pretty creepy. A couple of hours later, we all begin to pack up and make our way back home. I'm driving. Once we get near Sedona, the rodenticism guy asks to be let out. He says he's going to walk the rest of the way home. This guy lives in Phoenix. It's a two-hour drive. I let him out and do not give any cares. I just want him out of my car. Others seem pretty confused, and I don't care either. He gets out and we drive off. As we drive off, he just stares at us. He doesn't move, just twitches a little bit. I make a turn and I can't see him anymore. Immediately tell the others what had happened. Slightly scared that he'll jump out and start going gorilla on the car or something, but nothing. Others comment that he was being weird but still don't agree with me leaving him. Can't seem to convey that he was acting very weird. No one but the friend that went to get firewood with us believes me. He does not speak up much. I decide to drop it. I get back to work and the rhoticism guy doesn't show up for a few days. When he does get back, I stay away from him. Eventually, I end up talking to him. He's pretty pissed at all of us considering that we left him out there. I yell at him for being so creepy and besides, he asked to be let out. More arguing about the facts until I get it. He claims that on the first day, I took him out into the woods to show him something. We walked for hours and then I disappeared. Then he was lost in the woods for the entire day. I then realized something led my rhoticism friend out into the woods and left him there in order to take his place with us. That was not my rhoticism friend that spent the night with us. I never speak of it again and never tell the rhoticism guy my side of the story. I was participating in a reenactment one year. This was a Vietnam one, so I had my AR-15 alongside several extra blank loaded magazines. It was getting very dark, and most of the crowd had left. We talked to the group's captain and he recommended a night practice, basically a patrol in this abandoned core field. It sounded fun, so I said yes. After the first two scenarios were done, I was placed on the opposing force side. I went off into the woods and waited. That's when I noticed that it was dead silent. All that could be heard was the occasional gust of wind through the dead stalks of corn. I glanced around the forest. Then I crawled out when the wind started up again. Two loud cracks then filled the air, and I watched as the opposing force walked out of the cornfield with his weapon held up. This was followed by something standing up near the cornfield, firing again. Now, if you've never shot at night, it's a sight to see. The sudden light of the gun's flash makes everything freeze. It's to the point that you can quickly survey the area after a shot is fired, or so you think. Anyways, he soon shot as well, so I continued into the cornfield and lie down in a nice spot, hoping they'll come my way. I rest my rifle in a nice spot on my shoulder, and everything goes quiet. That's when I hear a deep breathing beside me. I slowly turn my head, looking to my right. It's dark as hell, so I can't see a dang thing. I could use my light, but that would give away my position, and I was not about to do that. I peer through the blanket of darkness, seeing what looked like fur. I slowly roll over to my side and drew my knife, just in case it was a dog or something that wanted to fight me. Something then moved in front of me. I quickly readjusted, but missed what it was. When I glanced back to where the breathing was, I saw a bare space. I soon got up and moved, somewhat shaken at this point. That's when I heard another two cracks, along with the captain laughing. I walked right into his line of fire. That was it. The game was done. His next idea was to use the woods only. Okay, sounds fun. I loaded up a fresh mag and followed him in. I was at the back, in case they tried to flank the rear. After a few minutes of walking, I heard some rustling nearby. I called for my team to hold it, then took a knee and looked towards the bushes where I heard the noise. I saw what looked to be a person standing there. That's it, just standing. I figured it was the opposing force, so I fired. Everything froze, and I could see what could only be described as a person dragging back from hell. They were beaten up and mingled looking, with these pale white eyes. When I tried to take a closer look, it went black again. The captain glared at me for a little bit for exposing our position. He didn't see whatever it was and thought that it was for no reason. We continued down the trail and hit this ambush, winning the fight. We gathered up and cleared our weapons, then began our trek back to camp. When we reached the cornfield again, I glanced around the group. We'd be gone out with six, and I counted seven, including myself, in both times. Strange, but maybe I miscounted before. After all, it was dark and I was pretty tired. When we reached the camp, I counted again. Six, including me. Something wasn't right. 
I asked about the other guy that was with us, and I got a funny look as a response, so I ignored it and went to sleep. The rest of the evening was uneventful. I looked into this recently, and I want to say it was a skinwalker, but it doesn't fit. The things didn't do us harm. It also changed what it looked like several times, if it was the same thing. Either way, I haven't gone out at night for a long time. When I was 10 to 12 years old, I lived with my mother. We were below poverty level poor. We lived up in the mountains around Santa Cruz, California. My mother had a friend that owned a large bit of property up there and let us stay in a trailer up there. Our trailer was very small and was right beside a garden. A chain link fence ran around the garden to keep the dog the owner had out, along with other animals. Deer and other things were very common in this area. Also inside the fence was a single room it was built like a tiny house, but it only had one single room on the inside. This room had electricity, and since our actual trailer didn't, I spent a lot of time out there. I was super into video games. There was one thing that you should know about this. This small fenced area was only a small part of the property, but most of it was heavily forested. Also, I refused to leave the fence area, because the owner's dog had been mistreated by children in the past, and was very sketchy towards me at all times. If I was ever alone, it would bite at me, even through the fence. The fence was very tall and it was at least 7 feet high. The fence wasn't movable, so as long as I kept the gate closed, I was safe. That said about the tiny bit of property, there was no one else around for miles. My mom's van is parked out in front of the gate to the fenced-in area, and a single unpaved road runs from this garden for about a mile to the main house. Every now and then I would bring friends up and they'd stay the night with me. We all thought it was pretty cool, you know, like camping out, sort of. Besides, we would get our own room to stay in and play video games all night. It was like a dream come true, really. The downside was simple. When it got dark out, it really got dark. No city around, and the trailer would not be lit up. There would be no bathroom to use in the room, and you would have to go walk out in the dark garden in order to get to the trailer to use it. All things would happen out here from time to time. It was always something that could be easily explained away. Noises like people working at night sometimes, or once me and my friend were sitting out in the garden and we saw a shadow as big as a small bear bound up a tree, but the tree didn't shake like there was any weight on it. The dog also creeped me out, but you know, angry dog, I was a kid. It happens. Now, I am a scaredy cat. I've always been. To be honest, I don't know why I even come here to tell you this scary story. I have trouble walking through a lit house if I'm even alone. My friends, however, tend to be more outgoing. Just kind of those people to get along with, I suppose. This time I had a friend over. His name was Jacob. We were staying up all night and playing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 on my Sega Genesis on a ratty old television. We started to play as the sun went down, and by the time we were finished with the game, it was about 2 a.m. That's when we heard it. We turned off the game, getting ready to find something else to play. There was a rumbling in the woods behind the room we were in like someone was rolling something very heavy around. We hadn't heard it before because of the noises from what we were playing was too loud. Immediately, I had goosebumps. Jacob was not really worried about it, but it's not like he was scared all the time or anything. The backyard was forced for miles, and it sounded like someone was constructing something, dragging something very heavy and very big. Eventually, Jacob convinced me to play some more games. I agreed on the condition that we would turn the volume down pretty low so we could hear if something was happening outside. We started playing and I didn't even notice the noise because I was so engrossed. A couple of hours later, Jacob said he had to use the bathroom. I was feeling fine by then, so I was fine when he left to the trailer to relieve himself. He was taking a while, so eventually I decided I was going to go check on him. Besides, I could use the bathroom and grab a snack while I was at it. I opened the door to leave and he was just standing at the doorway, right outside the door. It scared the crap out of me. I asked him what he was doing and he just stood there, blocking the exit. I realized he must have sneaked up on the door, because I could hear him walk away from the room, but I hadn't heard him walk back to the room. It was super quiet out. There were no noises from the city. He refused to say anything or respond. He just stood there. I told him that he was really creeping me out. But it was not unlike him to try to do this to scare me. Finally, I decided just to go to the trailer and use the bathroom myself, partially because I knew that my mother would be sleeping in there. 
I told him what I was doing, then moved past him. When I pushed him out of the way a little, I felt his skin, and it was freezing. I jumped a little, but it was a cold night and had been standing there for like 30 minutes, I figured. So I figured that this was to be expected. I walked as quickly as I could over to the trailer. He followed me, like right on my tail. It was unnerving. I joked a little, saying that he'd already surprised me by scaring me at the door, and that the joke was already over. Finally, I got to the trailer and walked in. He didn't follow, he just stayed at the door. I checked on my mom, who was fast asleep, then turned to go to the bathroom. Now, it being a porta potty, we kept the bathroom door shut because, well, it smelled pretty bad. When I reached for the door and to try to open it, it was locked. A nervous voice came from behind the door. Uh, I'm in here. I quickly turned to look at Jacob. The door was still open, and there was nothing there, but the pitch black night. I froze in terror. I would have heard the bathroom door open if he had come in behind me and gone that way. There was no way to do it quietly. It creaked like no other. I yelped so loud that my mother woke up startled. I stared at the doorway, unable to bring myself to move a muscle. She got up and walked over there and looked out the door. Not seeing anything, she closed it and asked me what was going on. By now, Jacob was coming out of the bathroom and acting perfectly normal, but a bit confused. I explained what had happened, and Jacob said that he was just taking a long time in the bathroom. Neither of them believed me at all, no matter how much I insist. My mom is sure that I just got sleepy and imagined it. Jacob just thought I was trying to prank him. So my mom gets out this big flashlight and walks us back to the room. She tells us to go to sleep, then leaves and goes back to bed herself. Now this room doesn't have any windows or anything, so after a while, I calm back down a little. I'm telling myself that my mom was right, that I must have been pretty tired and just imagined it. Jacob insists that he was in the bathroom the whole time. I'm inclined to believe him because there's just no way to really get around without being heard. So I settle down. I'm a little bit rattled, but I'm thinking I can just sleep it off through the night. Suddenly, the dog starts going nuts right beside us. The room is right against the fence, so the dog must have been right outside. I jumped so high I was surprised I didn't hit the roof. Jacob starts laughing at me, saying that I'm losing it because the dog is barking at a squirrel. It keeps going on like that for a long time. Suddenly, the barking stops and gets replaced by whimpering. We hear the dog run away. There's about 45 seconds of silence before we hear something new. A small scratching sound at the back wall of the room. We both try to be as silent as we can. Eventually, it stops. After five or so minutes of silence, Jacob decides to be brave. He insists he's going to go get my mother up, tell her that something crazy is going on outside and that we're gonna go from there. With some kind of divine adult protection, no doubt. I wished that he would not believe me, but there's no way I was going out there. Never. He arms himself the best he can with a tennis racket that we had in the room. He then takes a couple of deep breaths and opens the door and dashes out. I close it as quickly as I can behind him. In less than 30 seconds, I hear a scream. Not long after the door flies open and he comes back in looking pale as a ghost. He's breathing like he just ran a marathon. His eyes look as big as dinner plates. I ask what is going on like four times before he finally starts getting words out. He tells me that when he walked out there and as he's walking through the garden as quickly as he could, he saw my mother just standing there. He tried to talk to her but she stared at him with a blank expression. Getting super creeped out because of what happened to me earlier, he took a couple more steps towards her telling her that he thought someone was out in the woods. Suddenly, her face turns to an awkward smile. Then he realizes something terrible. He hadn't noticed it sooner because of the darkness and how much of a hurry he was in. She was on the other side of the fence. Now, the door to this room does not lock, and as I explained earlier, this room had no windows. He had been trying to move stuff in front of the door as he told his story, and by the end, I was helping him. In retrospect, whatever it was harassing us seemed to be adverse to actually entering the room or the trailer because the first flash gate did not come in either time. He totally could have. This room was not sturdy at all. Either way, we stacked everything we could against the door, thinking somehow that, like in cartoons, that this totally would keep out a creature. For the rest of the night, we heard scratches coming from all around the room. I cried. 
Jacob looked like he might have left his body with fear. At one time, I thought I heard it speak too. I heard it right next to me where I was resting, against the wall. It was in my mother's voice, and it was pretty quiet. The creature used the exact phrasing and intonation she had used earlier in the night. What's wrong? Followed immediately by, go to sleep. The sun must have come up eventually. The scratching eventually stopped. We heard my mom come to get us. This time it was actually her. We absolutely refused to leave the room. When we finally left the room, I bursted into tears again. We had never experienced anything like this and we eventually moved away, but that night still haunts me. I still refuse to go out at night unless I'm with a bunch of people, and I will never ever live in the woods again. Here are just a few of some of my favorite stories coming from the Skinwalker Ranch. Keep in mind that this is not a comprehensive list. There are probably stories that I like much more that I have not heard of coming from this location. With that being said, let's get to the stories. Skinwalker Ranch has been dubbed the world's hotspot from paranormal activity to UFO and Skinwalker sightings. There have also been multiple sightings of humanoid creatures, as well as aliens in this area. The Skinwalker Ranch is located in the Uinta Basin. The Native American tribe, the Utes, believe that the Navajo tribe placed a curse on this area to curse the Ute tribe during their inhabitation of this area. To this day, both tribes refuse to walk onto this land. The beginning of the Skinwalker Ranch is just as mysterious as the events that plagued it. The land was believed to be owned by, but not used by, a family that refused to stay there. This was until the early 90s that the Sherman family came to purchase the property at an incredible price. The Shermans were up and coming cattle farmers and this location would be perfect for them to live and herd cattle. Upon the first viewing of the property's home, the home was disorganized and showed signs of a concerning lifestyle. All of the home's entrances, including the windows, had heavy deadbolts on them, preventing anyone or anything to enter the home. Not only were these entrances laden with these locks, but also the interior room doors on both sides. This is often thought as to lock something or someone in a room if anything did get inside the house. The area behind the front door had these hooks with large chains hooked up to it. Many people think that the previous owners owned large dogs to protect the home from dangerous intruders. The Shermans were startled by this, but not enough to dissuade them from purchasing the property. Upon the first day of moving in, the Shermans were unpacking their vehicles when the father noticed a large animal gingerly making its way towards them. At first the family had no idea what they were looking at due to the large size of the animal, and also the large distance at which the animal was away. Upon the creature coming closer, they were able to see that the creature was a large wolf. The account said that the wolf's head was able to come to Terry Sherman's shoulder. Terry was above six feet tall, so this was quite startling. What was even more startling than the creature's size was the creature's actions. Instead of appearing wild and untamed, the creature came up to Mr. Sherman, allowing him to pet him. After petting the large wolf a few times, Terry allowed his family to come over and pet what appeared to be their new friend. During this time not so far away was an enclosed cattle area where cattle had just been transported. The cattle were aware of what was going on with the family and the wolf and the cattle seemed to react how they do when most predators are nearby. All except for one lone calf that was sticking its head out of the pen to get a better view of the wolf. Once the wolf saw the young calf make its fatal mistake, the huge beast quickly closed the gap and bit down on the calf's neck that was exposed from the metal bars of the pen. Terry watched in horror as the beast began thrashing around with the calf's neck in its jaws. Terry grabbed an axe handle and began beating the beast in the hind legs and ribs, hopefully to release its clinch on the calf. 
This had no effect on the beast, and told his son, who was watching all of this unfold, to grab the 357 Magnum in the truck and to give it to him. The son did as told, and Terry fired three shots point blank. The beast didn't even respond until Terry shot one at its heart. The large wolf then let go, but only wandered a few feet away, seemingly unharmed. Terry went inside and grabbed his hunting rifle and named it again at the beast. When he fired, chunks of the beast would fly off clearly, marking a hit, but the beast would only walk a few meters away into the woods, seemingly unharmed. Terry and his son would follow the beast into the woods, but after some time of tracking the large wolf prints, the prints would disappear as if the animal vanished into thin air. The next strange event would be cattle mutilations. This was originally thought to be the result of a larger animal, especially the wolf from the first day, but was later discarded due to the strange nature of the mutilation of the animals on the ranch. The cattle found around the ranch would have strange cuts and removed only some organs. These cuts seemed to be precision cut with a laser of some kind, due to the cuts of also being carterized. This became an issue for the Shermans. Each mutilated livestock would result in thousands of dollars in lost goods. Around the same time as these mutilations were sightings of UFOs in the distance. The first account that stood out was when Terry was walking around the property with his son and nephew. They then saw what appeared to be headlights within the boundaries of the Sherman property. Terry thought that maybe these were the men responsible for the cattle mutilations, so he went to confront them. While walking to confront whoever was behind the set of headlights, something strange happened. The light seemed to drive away, but then ascend into the sky. The lights then flew into the night sky, leaving the Shermans absolutely baffled. Even more disturbing than the cattle's being mutilated would be one of the events where the Sherman's family pet dog would chase after a light in the nearby forest. Terry was not able to keep up with his dog, but also chased the light in the forest hopefully being able to find some answers. While following his dog, Terry was able to hear his dog in the distance and was using his dog's bark to help him locate his pet. However, about midway through the dense forest, he heard his dog begin to whine and then heard a strange machine-like noise, and then silence. Terry searched the forest but was not able to find his dog. What he was able to find was what appeared to be a puddle of goop and burnt hair in the circle on the ground. Many people believe that this is the result of an alien vaporizing his dog. Another occurrence that plagued the Sherman family was the paranormal activity within the home on the ranch. Gwen Sherman, Terry's wife, would report things moving around the home in a fashion very similar to paranormal activity, much like a poltergeist. One common instance would be when Gwen would shower. Gwen would have a shower routine that she never strayed from, which required her to place a hairbrush and a towel next to the shower to make the morning routine all the more easier. However, since moving to the ranch, Gwen had noticed that her brush and towel would be moving or missing altogether. This would only be the beginning of what would be a terrifying next couple of years for the Shermans. Gwen would also experience other odd occurrences, such as her putting away her groceries only to return to the kitchen to find the groceries back in the plastic bags. Both Gwen and Terry would also see a menacing shadow figure around the ranch, which would eventually find its way inside the Sherman home. The shadow figure would be reported to be peering into windows and shaking the home, terrorizing the family. Things would become much more worse with the shadow man. There's an account with Terry and Gwen both waking up in sleep paralysis to see the shadow man standing at the foot of their bed. Some people think that the shadow man was a ghost that once lived on the property, while many others believe that it's an interdimensional being, kind of like an alien, that was trying to warn the family of what's to come. Around this time in 1995, Robert Bigelow heard about this ranch and formed a group called NIDS, or National Institute of Discovery Science. This group would study many fringe sciences, from UFOlogy to wormholes and other paranormal activity. But don't let this dissuade you into thinking that this was a group of weekend warriors or ghost hunters with video cameras. This group was comprised of many PhD scientists in chemistry and other notable sciences. All the people involved were highly credited personnel in the science community. 
Robert offered to purchase the property from Terry for $200,000, which Terry agreed to as long as he could be ranch manager and still house his cattle on the land. Robert agreed, since he was only wanting the land to be able to conduct tests with his new formed group. The first couple of months were uneventful for the new ownership. This led to many people believing that Terry fabricated or stretched the truth to be able to sell his land for more than it was actually worth. However, things did begin to pick up when the team began seeing the lights in the sky. The NIDS team did everything they could to disprove the lights in the sky, from testing the magnetic frequencies in the area, to even testing to see if there was a fault line nearby. The team also tested plants and ground samples to see if there were any hallucinating properties in that area that would cause people to see strange things. The test yielded nothing out of the ordinary. The team would also go out at night with night vision goggles to see if they could see anything that was happening with the cattle that were still being mutilated. The results were disturbing. With the aid of NIDS and night vision, Terry and the team were able to spot large creatures that resembled dog people that would walk on their hind legs. They also came across a few instances where they would seem to see a creature using an invisibility cloak of some kind. You're probably thinking, how do you see something that's invisible? Well, they were able to see this because they would see cattle being pushed as if something large was walking through the herd of cattle. They also witnessed on one instance, water being displaced as if something was walking through a stream, but were to be invisible. This led to probably one of the most disturbing instances on the ranch. One evening, two members of the NITS group were out scoping out the valley at 3.30 a.m. One member had a pair of binoculars while the other was taking photos with an infrared camera. In the valley below, the team member saw with the binoculars what appeared to be a light that was emanating a strange color. The light grew and the man with the binoculars said that he was able to see something what appeared to be a portal of some kind due to being able to see onto the other side which looked like a grotesque landscape. In this portal appeared to be a creature crawling on its hands and knees but at a fast pace. This creature was naked with no fur. It looked similar to a person but the limbs were long and bent at weird angles. The creature was able to make its way close enough to the team that they were able to hear the sound of rocks moving underneath its feet before disappearing. I was in Kentucky for four or five days and spent the night at my cousin's home. Of the grandchildren who were there, I was the youngest and ended up babysitting duty for the majority of the time I was there. I stayed in a little trailer at the top of a little hill along with a bunch of my younger cousins. During the day, everyone would go to my granddad's and leave me there with the kids and then come home for a few hours to put their kids to bed before heading back out to do whatever. The last night I was there, I stayed up pretty late. The kids were in bed and I had a place to myself for a few hours before I had to go back home. I went out and sat on the porch and I walked out to find this awful smell. The smell was very similar to what I refer to as smelted metal. I started gagging and walked down the stairs of the trailer thinking I would get some fresh air off the porch. As I got down, I saw in the moonlight what looked to be one of my younger cousins, Aiden. He was just standing there, with his back to me, a good 50 feet away from the trailer. I yelled out to the little kid that he needed to go back inside, where his mother would have his hide, but he just kept standing there. I kept hollering and walked up to him, and as I got closer, I noticed he seemed kind of off. He was standing, but he had his knees bent in a weird angle and his head was cocked to one of the sides. I tapped him on the shoulder, and he turned around. Aiden had this crazy, maniac smile on his face. He started to shake, and it took me a moment to realize that he was laughing, but no sound was coming out. I tried to pick him up and carry him inside, 
so I could look at him in some decent light and make sure that he was okay. But he must have backstepped as I tried to get him. I snatched at him and I caught him and he just started to scream this really guttural voice I didn't think he could make. It was just too deep and gruff for a five-year-old to make. While he was screaming, he was also flailing his arms and legs. He ended up making contact with my groin, so I dropped him, and he ran off towards the trailer. I sat there hunched over for a moment getting some air before running after him. He was gone when I looked up, so I ran inside, hoping he would have been waiting there for me in the living room. He wasn't. But after some searching around, I found him passed out in the top bunk of his bed. I was so confused, but I wasn't going to wake him up. I decided just to let him sleep and let his mom know what had happened. When she came home, I told her what had happened, and she woke up Aiden to ask why he was acting that way. Aiden had no clue what we were talking about, and we ended up sending him back to bed. His mom thinks that I must have had a crazy vivid dream and I made it all up. But the next morning, while I was packing up my stuff into the truck, I smelled that smell again. And I swore I saw Aiden darting underneath the trailer. I was about to follow him to see what he was doing when he walked out of the front door a split second later with the rest of his family. I just told myself that I was imagining things and I didn't say anything to my family. I live in northern Washington near a ton of woods and one day me and three of my friends Aaron, Jake, and Kyle made plans to go camping in the woods since we all loved the outdoors and just wanted to get away from it all. My friend Jake knew these woods the best and said that he had a great spot for us to go camping so we all got our stuff and headed into the woods. It took us two hours to get to the spot, which was perfect, and we got our stuff set up. After we set up our stuff, we ate and decided that we wanted to go exploring, with Jake leading the way. Everything was going great. We were going to go a lot further than I've ever gone in these woods, and eventually we made it to a clearing. That's when Jake started to act different. I didn't really think anything at first, I just blew it off as him being weird. As we walked across the clearing, I saw a grayish human thing walk into the woods on the far side, but again I just blew it off since I didn't want to get them riled up for no reason. We were about three-fourths of the way across this clearing when we saw a mutilated deer laying there. When I say mutilated, I mean it was cut clean in half with its head completely missing and parts of its skin ripped clean off. What made everyone so uneasy was the fact that there were no flies around this carcass at all and it was still warm. I instantly thought to that thing I saw in the woods and told them about it. Aaron said he saw it too but he thought he was seeing things also. I then got the unshakable feeling that I was being watched and I could see that everyone else was creeped out. We all decided to go back to camp, and since it was getting late, we decided that we would go to the clearing some other time. That's when I heard the sound of someone running up really fast. I turned around and there was nothing there. I tell my friends that we should hurry and leave because I don't want to go out anymore. They agreed, and we started jogging through the woods with the sun setting. We didn't think that we would be in the woods for so long, so no one brought a flashlight, and it was getting dark fast. About 20 minutes into our jog back to camp, we hear a blood-curdling scream coming no less than 50 meters away. At this point, we are running through the woods, and it is getting darker every minute. That's when we hear a weird growl off to the side of us, rustling and twigs snapping. I'm terrified at this point, and we are all sprinting through the woods back to this site. We finally make it back and tear into our tent with all of us hyperventilating. None of us say anything for about five minutes, 
when Jake says, let's get out of here. Right after he says that, we hear a, let's get out of here. Right outside of the tent. Everyone is beyond terrified at this point. We have no idea what to do. We sit there in complete silence and we hear two sets of footsteps going around our campsite, throwing our stuff around. One of the things even tries to open the tent, but I hold the zipper down with all the force I can muster. Literally everyone is crying at this point. Eventually, those things leave, but we are too scared to even go near the door. About three hours of trying to figure out what just happened, Jake decides he is going to check outside to make sure the coast is clear so we can get out of here. I decide to go with him since I didn't want him to get killed. When he opened the door, we stepped out. He shined the flashlight into the woods and we saw three of those things staring right back at us. Their eyes were huge and sunken in, but also pitch black. They were about six feet tall and lanky. When they noticed that we saw them, they ran faster than anything I've ever seen run into the forest. Jake and I booked it back to the tent and told Kyle and Aaron what just happened. Aaron became hysterical and came up with a brilliant idea to run back to get to the car and get out of there. I tried to stop him, but he was going to run on pure fear and booked it into the woods. We had no choice but to go looking for him since those things were probably still out there. As we were grabbing our flashlights, we hear him scream in the distance, followed by a loud growl. We ran out of the tent and began searching for him, and spent the next 20 minutes looking. Kyle begs us to go back to the campsite, since we kept hearing something walking in the woods really close behind us. We get back to the campsite to find Aaron standing facing towards the tent is back towards us. Jake starts to cry and says, What were you thinking? You're so stupid. Aaron then robotically turns and says, Haha, don't worry guys, I'm fine. We all look at each other, but we decide to get back into the tent for safety. Jake says that it's best for us just to wait it out over the night and leave in the morning. I then notice bruises and cuts all on Aaron's arms and legs, and when I asked him about it, he only said, Haha, don't worry guys, I'm fine. Aaron kept saying that the exact same way. We all just tried to ignore him and get through the night alive. The rest of the night we heard those things walking around our campsite, and Aaron kept asking if we wanted to go back out there for some stupid reason, like, hey, I saw the sweet rock back out in the woods, you want to go see it? After an eternity, morning came and the noises stopped. We all began sprinting to the car when about 20 minutes in, I noticed Aaron wasn't to be seen. Since my other friends were still running, I didn't want to fall behind and I kept moving. We finally made it back to the car and we all agreed that Aaron was probably gone. We sped home and swore to never talk about this to anyone ever again. We told Aaron's mom that he walked off in the middle of the night and we couldn't find him. We were investigated about six months on and on, but they couldn't find any proof or motive that we would have wanted to kill him. We tried helping with the search, but nothing came of it. To this day, late at night, when I hear anything off in the woods, I think of Aaron. Three months ago, I was camping with a friend in a very remote part of Northern California. I'm a massive wilderness junkie. I have been camping all of my life and I spend so much of my free time hiking and rock climbing, etc. A buddy of mine who also enjoys the outdoors wanted to head up to the Sierras for a weekend and asked me to go with him. It was our second night and we were sitting by the campfire. We weren't staying at a campsite. We had hiked for about 10 miles from our cars to a clearing with a beautiful view we had stayed once before. 
Around 10 p.m., my buddy got tired and went to bed in his tent. I wanted to stay up for a little bit longer. About 45 minutes after he went to bed, I saw this object coming from the valley below. It was a basic flying saucer shape with multiple circular lights rotating around the edges that changed colors over and over. I was completely shocked. I watched it for maybe 15 seconds, then decided I had to wake him up so he could see and not think I was crazy. I stood and when I looked back towards it, the thing was gone. I called out his name and that's when everything got really weird. I didn't hear my own voice when I called out. Everything was completely silent. I could move my eyes around but nothing else on my body. I remember seeing the fire had completely frozen and everything looked like a picture, like time had stopped or something. Then there was a flash of light and I blacked out. I woke up later just as the sun was starting to rise. I was outside laying in the dirt, shivering next to the fire that had been long out. I felt like I had been drugged, totally in this haze. I sluggishly yelled out to my friend a couple of times and he came out of the tent. He was really confused to say the least. I tried to explain to him what happened but my memory was really foggy and I couldn't articulate the words properly. We left within 30 minutes. I was totally silent on our car ride back, falling in and out of sleep for several hours. He dropped me off at my house, and I passed out for basically the entire day. A few weeks later, I was messing around with an amp, and it released this static ooh sound when I unplugged my guitar. For some reason, this sound somehow triggered my memory, and I remembered everything. When I came back into consciousness, I was suspended laterally in a circular mechanism in a position very similar to Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. These clear glass-like shackles, type restraints were holding me in place. I was completely nude and standing above me were three typical aliens. They were about four feet tall and wearing white spandex-like suits. Two were just standing there, observing the other, who was extracting blood from a vein under my armpit with this weird-looking syringe. Although they didn't show any real reaction, I could still tell that they were surprised that I was awake. I couldn't move at all, except for my eyes and lips. I was absolutely terrified. In a sort of fight-or-flight mode, my heart pounded from an influx of adrenaline. I can't even begin to tell you how scared I was. But I also felt this total rage. I wanted to kill them. I wanted to rip out this device and completely destroy them. My brain went totally primal. Just animal instinct and I could tell that they could sense my anger because they all stepped back simultaneously. Two of them disappeared from my view and presumably left the room. The other one was just staring at me, void of any emotion. I wanted so badly to just shut my eyes, but I forced myself to stare right back at it, trying my hardest not to blink. Then the other two came back, and they weren't alone. I honestly couldn't believe my eyes. Standing behind them were two very tall, very human-looking beings, a male and female. They looked like Norse gods, with bright golden hair and massive eyes. The male eyes were dark and blue, the females were violet. I suppose they are what the UFO community refers to as Nordics. This was quite bizarre to me. My family descended from Sweden and I am very Nordic looking. Blonde hair, blue eyes, the works. I know this is cliche, but I heard a feminine voice in my mind. For some reason, I could understand what she was telling me although it wasn't like she was saying anything in English. She told me something like, Be calm. You're not in danger. I relaxed and asked her what they wanted with me. She said that they were just checking up on me. I asked her what she meant by that. She said that she had saved me from when I first came into being. I immediately knew what she was talking about. I was born two months premature. 
My mother was horribly sick during labor. We both had fevers of 104. The strange thing is that the doctors had absolutely no idea what was wrong with us. I was given two spinal taps, my mother three. I spent four nights in that bubble housing ICU thing. There was a decent chance I was going to die. Then one day, I started getting better and made a full recovery. The doctors were very worried that the whole ordeal might have permanently damaged my body and possibly my brain, but I was totally fine. I asked her, why did you save me? This time I heard a deep male voice stating that this conversation was for a later time. I asked them if they are human. He said, no. I was confused considering that they looked quite human. I asked him if man had come from them. He said yes. That they had come here 200,000 years ago and created mankind by combining their DNA with that of our primate ancestors. I wanted to know why they looked especially similar to me more than other humans. He stated that many males of their kind found female humans attractive and mated with them. This directly passed on some of their physical features to Nordic people. I wanted to know more, but they declined and said that it was time for me to go back. I blacked out instantly and woke up by the extinguished campfire, clothed and shivering. I was sleeping on my back in my bed in my parents' home where I lived when suddenly I woke up from a deep dreamless sleep. I opened my eyes and a male humanoid shadow seemed like it pushed itself up from laying on top of me. It seemed surprised that I woke up and interrupted it doing whatever it was doing. It wasn't anything sexual, if anything it was, not sure how to describe it, feeding or scanning me. Makes the most sense, though I know both of these things are sort of at odds with one another. It swooped back at me in a rush and I fell asleep instantly. I woke up about two hours later than my normal wake up time, and I felt okay, just a little sluggish. I never saw it again. One Friday night, my girlfriend and I were at a friend's house and decided to leave around 1am. It was very foggy outside, being that we lived near the river in rural Illinois. My girlfriend goes to the gas station on her way home to this rural town where we both lived, about a block away from each other. I get home and I don't hear from her for a bit, until she calls me very shaken up and crying. She says on her drive home she saw something crouched in the road on the right side. It looked to be fairly small, possibly a child. She rolled down her window and asked if she was okay and got no answer only continued sobbing from what seemed to be a child. She pulls over and gets out of the car, walks up to whatever it was and attempted to ask if it needed anything. The thing stands up on two feet at over six feet tall and lets out this awful screech and runs off the road into some pretty dense woods by the river. She can't say if it was a boy or a girl, but she can say she never saw or heard anything like that before. This happened in the middle of the night at my mom's house some years back in Northern California. I was asleep on the floor in the living room. Next to the living room is a room that can be seen through two large windows and French doors. We call it the middle room. Next to that was my mom's room and my stepdad. The light in the middle room was left on, partly dimmed at night. I woke up and saw three short gray aliens walking around in the middle room. They were about five feet tall, had long skinny arms, and were wearing dark colored jumpsuits. The arms stood out to me the most because of how thin they were, with little to no muscle tone like you would see in a human. The eyes looked solid black and were larger than a human's, though not as large as seen in some of the depictions. I don't remember anything else about the aliens, nor their features, but I do remember that I was able to sit up part way 
as I was watching them, but I had no energy to do anything else. They didn't seem to notice that I was watching them. Within a couple of minutes, I fell back to sleep. In the morning, my mom walked in and told me that there were aliens there the night before. I then told her that I saw them too, and I asked her how many there were and what they looked like. Her description matched what I had seen. She had other alien encounters, but this was the only time that I was there to witness it. An investigation group was called in on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. The incident begins when two sisters observe a black-eyed boy outside their home. Not long later, a group of ashen white-skinned children with black eyes were seen congregating around the property in attempt to interact with the other children living there. The first two occasions there were only two of them and they asked to be let inside to get food. The third time was when the third one showed up and this time they asked for blood. They were never granted access to the home. The children described their voices as not normal and robotic. Pets were also missing around this time, around the property. The parents of the children recall seeing these spooky children too. They also claimed to have noticed strange events around their home, including poltergeist activity and the sightings of at least one or two strange entities that they thought to be alien. In July of 2012, my friend and I, who were both 18, decided to go camping for a week. We decided that we did not like any of the lame paid campsites and decided to camp illegally in this amazing area surrounded by woods. Now mind you, the nearest town is at least half an hour's drive away in that we are also in Australia, so creatures are already trying to kill us. The first few days of camping were great even though it was pretty rainy. Every night, we ended up talking for hours and being hilarious, and then going to sleep in this massive tent I bought. One night, we ended up huddled in fear. We can hear something walking around the freaking tent. It walks around us for hours. While we're freaking out, we hear a screech from the distance, and whatever is stalking us from outside the tent takes off and runs away in the direction of the sound. My friend and I let out a nervous laugh and the entire atmosphere completely brightens. We eventually go to sleep and we wake up a little before noon the next day. The next day, I'm cooking us a meal and we need more firewood. I can't leave because the food will burn easily, so my friend naturally volunteers. Looking back, this was the first time one of us had gone alone into the woods. Before my friend enters the woods, he pauses before going in. He doesn't say anything to me, but I know that he's afraid. Finally, my friend summons some courage after a few seconds and enters the woods, disappearing from my sight. I'm not wearing a watch, but it's felt like an hour and my friend still hasn't returned with the firewood. I assume that my friend's taking a dump or something, so I give him some privacy and I decide to go find some wood for myself. For some reason, I thought to myself, it would be pretty odd if some inbred people killed and ate my friend. I would have to avenge him, wouldn't I? After more time of my friend being gone, I finally grab my rifle and a big knife, as well as a flashlight, and make my way into the woods, yelling for my friend. I'm not that deep into the woods when I begin to feel that feeling of someone watching me. I am walking into the woods for about five minutes looking for my friend when I finally see someone in front of me. I assume that the person in front of me is my friend and I begin to make my way towards him when I hear that screech from the night before not very far behind me. We both take off and sprint towards our tent that was in the clearing. As we are running back, I lose sight of my friend, and I catch sight of what made that sound behind me. Whatever it was, it looks big. I consider how many bullets I have, and I realize that I wouldn't have enough to kill it. 
I continue running through the woods and make it back to my campsite. To my surprise, my friend is sitting there, but he's wearing a change of clothes. I begin to let out a nervous laugh and tell him how scary that was. He seems confused. What was scary? He says. Now, I'm a bit confused. What, you didn't hear that screech back there in the woods? He shakes his head, no. I figured that I was just being paranoid for being in the woods alone, and I write it off as no big deal. Anyways, we start to drink and decide to call it a night and crawl into the large tent. I still have a large knife attached to my belt. I wake up once in the night, and I find my friend staring at me. Me being uncomfortable, I start a conversation with him about a girl that I like. My friend seems to be really aware and listening to everything I say. Suddenly, I feel like my bladder is going to burst from all the drinking from earlier. I stagger out of my tent and make my way down to this little river that goes past her campsite. I take a pee in the early morning light while in awe of the majesty of nature. As I'm peeing, I notice something gray sticking out of the riverbed. I wade my way out and I pull it out. It's my friend's shirt that he wore from yesterday, before entering the woods alone. It seems to be torn up pretty bad and it's got a little bit of blood on it. Mind you, I'm still a little bit drunk from the night before and I decide to throw the shirt back into the river. I then make my way back to the campsite and my friend is missing. Again, being a little bit drunk, I figured that he just went out to get some firewood for breakfast. I pass out and wake up a couple of hours later. My friend is back, but he's asleep and his hands are dirty. That's when weird things begin to happen. The fire needs restarting, so I try to restart the fire. While pushing the coals away and looking through the ash, I saw a button that was off of one of the pants that he was wearing yesterday. Why did my friend burn his pants? That's weird. Today was the last day of our camping trip and we start to pack up and leave. My friend wakes up and he's still kind of weird like he was yesterday. I am packing and he gives me this weird look. I tell him that he needs to start helping and to get ready to leave. He then asks me to go into the woods and get some firewood because he's hungry. Uh, no. I tell him that once we're both packed and ready to leave, that I'll go out into the woods and get some wood for us. During this whole camping trip, my car isn't parked too far away, and it's about a three minute hike to get there. We both have a lot of stuff, so it takes us a couple of trips to get all of our stuff into the car. I turn the car on and make sure that everything is working since it hasn't been driven in a week, and I turn on the radio. The radio has the weather station on and it says that it's about to rain tonight. I turn back to get my last little bit of stuff from the campsite and I see my friend. He is standing just inside the wood line. He says coldly, Can we get more firewood now? For some reason, I suddenly get this feeling deep in my stomach that something was wrong. I respond, Uh, nah man, weather warning. Eat some leftover food and I'll buy you something in the next town. We should get moving, it's an 8 hour drive. While picking up my last little bit of trash, he doesn't even eat anything. I ask him if he's alright. He responds coldly again. Yeah, I'm fine. Are you sure we can't stay another night? I don't think the storm will hit here. Mind you, that my friend is still standing inside the wood line, about 5 feet deep. As I was about to tell him that I was not staying another night, I see something large move behind him, deep in the woods. What the hell was that? He doesn't turn around. I pull out my knife and for some reason, he gets almost defensive and gives me a weird look. Dude, there's something behind you. He then turns around. Uh, I'm sure it was nothing, he says. I then convince him to follow me to the car and to go home. The whole way walking back to the car, he keeps looking behind himself multiple times. 
I'm trying my best to act normal because he's not. As we're walking back, I tell him about the bits of clothes I found in the fire. He tells me that while collecting firewood, that they got trashed up a bit and didn't want to bring it back home. How badly can you trash clothes looking for firewood? He then shrugs and we make our way to the car. Once we're in the car and I'm back out on the road, I feel much better. I keep trying to make conversation, but he doesn't put much effort into the conversation. I turn on the radio, and every so often, he repeats things that he hears on the radio. While on our long drive, I have time to think. I think about him not being worried about all the stuff that happened, and him watching me while I slept. Why did he try to get rid of his clothes? What was he hiding? Why was he trying to get me to go into the woods with him? I decide to give him a little test. I start to talk about some of the stupid stuff that we did as kids, and I would throw in fake things that actually never happened. Nonetheless, he would always agree with me. The more I think about it, I realize that he had not been acting like himself since he went missing into the woods. We stop at the first town that we come to, and I activate my phone and call my mother, telling her that everything was fun. I then ask my friend, are you going to call your parents? And he gets really confused, and then he gets his phone from his backpack. He then sends some text messages and puts his phone back. We have been driving for some time at this point, and we have only about an hour or two left from reaching our home. He slowly begins to join in on the conversation, but he doesn't sound the same as he used to. I decided to bring up some of the creepy stuff that had happened out at our campsite. I told my friend about the large animal that I saw in the woods and that it was about the size of a horse. He then gives me a weird response. I wouldn't worry about that, he says. I begin to feel uneasy and think that maybe this isn't my friend sitting next to me. Well, what about the thing that walked around our tent that first night? He then gives me this weird smile. Maybe it's a werewolf, he says. I laugh and I tell him, or maybe it's a hot girl or something. He laughs too. Or maybe something was just checking us out. I feel weird again. I force a laugh and say, why would anything do that? Like a cannibal or something? He looks out the window. I can't watch him because I'm trying to keep my eyes on the road. I then make a quick glance at him, and he's looking out the window. I can still feel my knife still on my hip, and my rifle is stored safely in the back. Do you think it could have been a skinwalker? I asked him. He then responds with a similar response. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that, he says. At this point, I'm just trying not to drive this car off the road. I'm freaking out so badly. I then turn on the radio, and we don't talk the rest of the ride. I seriously think that my friend had died out there, and that there is something else living inside of him now. I was a Butter Bar platoon leader for a CAV unit, and we were training at the National Training Center at Fort Benning. We were in the woods for a fire training exercise, and it takes about four days long and it involves a lot of land navigation. We had been out a few days and it had been pretty boring. About 1800 on the third day, I get a call from the company commander over the radio. He's pulling all the platoon leaders in and talking to us. All of the platoon leaders report to the company commander, and he tells us that there have been reports of a really big, aggressive bear that had been following groups around. If the bear shows up, just fire shots in the air to try to scare it off, and also, don't bury your trash. I was kind of annoyed by this, and I thought that it was just a big waste of time. At this point in the third day, it's pretty dark out, and I navigate back to my group. I was in warrior mode, and I left my flashlight off so I wouldn't be spotted by the other groups. I'm following the trail back to the rendezvous point, where my platoon were supposed to have set up a patrol base. While on the trail, I see headlights off in the distance, and I get off the trail and hide. I watch some Humvees pass by and look like range control or something. As the Humvees are driving by, I see its lights fall on something huge across the road for an instant before the Humvees drive on. I freak out for a second. 
I sit in utter silence for a few minutes, thinking it might be a bear. Nothing, no movement. After a while, I realize that I'm probably just being a tard and I get back on the trail. Nothing more out of the ordinary happens. I get around to the point where our patrol base should have been. I notice my group's chain lights heading off into the trail. So I follow into the woods and follow the lights. I get to the end of the chain lights and someone calls out a challenge. When you set up a patrol base, if you see someone you call out a challenge phrase and they're supposed to answer back with a password. It means that they're friendly. I don't remember the password, so I just say, it's me, don't worry about it. The guy that issued the challenge goes, eh, whatever, and lets me by. I finally make it back to base, and all is well. About an hour goes by, and I feel weirdly tense. I can't sleep. Suddenly, shouting comes from one side of the patrol base, immediately followed by a hail of blank fire, as the whole squad lights up an area. I grab my rifle and I run over, shouting for a status from the squad leader. No response yet. No one is moving or talking. I run up to one of the sentries and ask them what had happened. He said that he saw someone moving about 10 meters away and asked their position and called out challenge. He said that he heard someone say what I had said in the same tone and everything. So they were going to let the person pass. The guy on patrol says that suddenly the thing got closer and he had a bad feeling about something. The person in question finally arrives to base, but it's not me obviously. This person, more like a creature, has long hair. The whole squad starts shooting blanks in his direction. If you've ever shot blanks at night, you know that it blinds you for a few seconds. When the guy on patrol can finally see again, he says that the guy was gone. I talk to the guy on patrol, and after some time, I go back to bed. A couple of hours later, however, I am awakened again by another hail of blank fire. Again, I grab my rifle, and I run to the side of the patrol base where the fire is coming from. I get there, and almost no one is moving or talking. I ask, what the heck's going on? Team leader says he saw someone a little bit down the hill. They were watching us, so he issued a challenge. The guy called back, again, what I had responded earlier. Same tone, same inflections. The team leader is confused because he knows for a fact that I'm sleeping away in my bunk. The team leader is suspicious and figured maybe I had snuck out during the night. He asks me, or what he thinks is me, what I was doing out so late. The creature then responds what I had said earlier, except this time it doesn't make sense. It's out of context. The team leader is very confused. Finally, after some time, the team leader says he saw something, taller than normal, come out of the brush. Definitely was not a man. Again, naturally, the whole squad lights up whatever it was with the blank fire. Again, when everyone's able to see again, the guy is gone. Again, I go back to bed, and about 15 minutes later, the actual drill that we've been preparing for all week happens. I'm pretty excited and I grab my gun and join the gunfire. As part of the drill, we have to move locations and move our patrol base. During the drill, we have someone that is accountable for counting gear and counting people. The person that is accountable for counting all the gear and all the people now approaches me and says, when he counted the personnel in our group, he noticed that we had one too many people in our squad. So he counted again, and again, we had one too many people. Considering that this was a training exercise, he figured that one of the people from the other squads accidentally ended up in our group, but we had no idea who. I then helped the person in charge of accountability and counted again. This time we had our numbers correct. Where did this person go? Who was he? Was it the same person that tried to enter our camp twice, using my call out? How come this person sounded like me? Who, or whatever it was, must have been close to me that night when I made my call out, close enough that he could hear me. A part of me wishes that the night I walked back alone, that I actually had my flashlight on rather than off. But I figure that I'm pretty lucky, considering I was not able to see what followed me back to base. My parents used to be big outdoor buffs. My father is an ex-champion hobby boat racer, and my mother was an Alabama race country girl. 
They went on a trip with their friends when I was about 10 years old, and since then, they've refused to go camping anymore. Ever. My dad told me this story sometime after I had turned 18. My parents moved around a lot and only had one set of friends that they really kept in touch with, Danny and Lisa. Danny and Lisa weren't actually outdoor nuts, but they liked to hang out with my parents and did whatever they wanted to do. They all planned a five-day trip to a lake south of where they lived with a creek that was on Danny's father's property so they could keep camping and fish on the property all they wanted. My dad tells me that the first two days were normal, just camping, drinking, sharing stories while fishing and boating. The second night though was when things started to get weird. The second night they kept hearing yelps coming from the woods. It sounded like two dogs were in a fight, but they were just both hurt and yelping the whole time. They figured they were just coyotes and slept. The next day they continued on their adventures. That night they kept hearing those noises again, except this time. They were extremely close. So my dad and Danny went out to see if they could scare them off while my mom and Lisa stayed behind being scared out of their minds hiding in the tent. Anyway, my dad and Danny went looking in the woods for these coyotes that were fighting. My dad had a shotgun and Danny had a machete. My dad was just hoping to scare the coyotes, or whatever they were, with a loud gunshot. He wasn't actually trying to go kill them. They got to a clearing and could hear the noise, extremely loud, but it seemed to be coming from multiple directions. Now my dad was a bit of a kook. He swears that he saw Bigfoot at 14, but this is different. He just told Danny to get back. No questions, no explanations. Just Danny, we need to get back. So they did, but the sounds didn't fade away this time. Danny nervously asked my dad what was going on, but my dad wouldn't tell him. He just kept shushing him. Danny is a bit of a goofball, hence why I always liked Danny, and called him my Uncle Danny, so he thought that my dad was getting back at him for a prank. Danny kept nudging my dad, trying to get him to say, gotcha, but my dad never untensed. Finally, they got close to the creek, a ways up from the camp, and my dad told Danny to run, fast, sprint. Then my dad took off, no remorse. Danny apparently followed, but tripped and called out to my dad. My dad, unfortunately, refused to go back for him, even though Danny started crying and calling out for help. Danny was yelling that his leg was broken, it hurt, etc., but my dad kept running. Then, my dad, my mother, and Lisa all hear a really loud cougar roar coming from the woods. My dad says it sounded like two lionesses roaring but times 70. My dad says that it was so loud that it made his ears ring. After that roar, the cries from Danny had stopped. My dad got back to camp and the ladies asked them what was going on, but my dad just said that there was something out there. My mother being practical says, well yeah, no duh, but what was it? My dad wouldn't answer. Lisa is freaking out and asking where Danny is. But my dad just keeps saying that he'll be here in a second. A few hours pass and the ladies are extremely worried about Danny. While my dad would only cringe when they would say something. Finally, from the opposite side my dad had arrived from, Danny came walking out just fine, wordlessly. My dad cocked his shotgun but waved it as a survival readiness, something my mother says she'll never forget. This is when my mother knew that something was wrong. Danny then walks up to camp and nudges his way next to my mother, but after the weird looks that he's getting and the death glare from my father, he then moves closer to Lisa who's been nagging at him for the next 10 minutes. But Danny would only grunt yes or no, or would just stare into the fire. My dad finally asked Danny what had happened to his leg, and Danny looked up confused. My dad told him, I thought you said it was broken. Danny then looked up at him and replied, broken. Then, as if on cue, he starts screaming, Oh, my leg! I think it's broken! The ladies in the group obviously want to try to treat Danny's leg, but Danny doesn't seem to want any help. The ladies in the group rationalize and say that Danny must have been in shock, and that explains why he was acting so weird, but my dad isn't buying it. While the ladies are still trying to negotiate with Danny, my dad then suggests that, hey, let's just go to bed and we'll worry about it tomorrow. 
My mom gives him a look, and my dad gives her another look, and they both agree to go to the tent. During the night, my parents said that they heard Lisa nagging to Danny, and he would never reply to any of her responses. Being enraged, she then finally says that she's going to go out in the woods and pee. Danny asks if he could come with her, since there were animals out in the woods. She says okay, and they left. My dad woke up about 10-ish in the morning and started making breakfast. Danny and Lisa were gone. My mom asked where they were, and my dad would not reply. After a little while, they both came back, rather unceremoniously, and without a word. They weren't holding hands, and they were not in each other's arms as usual, just kind of awkwardly standing next to each other. They refused food, and Danny would randomly yell out, My leg! And Lisa would randomly complain about feeling ill. My mom then suggested that they go home and call off the trip on account of Danny's leg. Danny had not been limping at all. Danny and Lisa just nodded. My father just kind of watched. They all agreed, so Danny and Lisa got in my parents' car, not theirs, and just waited. They didn't pack up anything, any coolers, tents, bags, anything. My mom came over and asked if they were going to grab their things, and they just shook their heads. My dad asked, why don't you take your car? And they both said, broken. Just like Danny had the night before. My dad sighed and packed up the car and they drove off. Danny and Lisa stayed quiet the whole way and, except for their random mumblings to each other, completely indecipherable. My parents then took them home and they came and got me afterwards from the babysitter. I could tell that something was wrong besides coming back a couple days early. They said that Danny got hurt so they had to come home. I remember asking if I could go see Danny and Lisa, but my dad replied, no, a little too quickly, and so I thought that he was mad at them. I remember this as a child because they were kind of my friends too, and I figured my dad was just being mean. A few weeks later, I asked about Uncle Danny, and my dad said that we're not going to see them anymore. I was mad, and so I demanded to know why. He told me something about his dad being sick, and so I was really sad. Then I forgot about it, and life went on. Fast forward five years. I am at the supermarket where I used to live and remembered that Danny and Lisa live not too far away from here. Now that I was able to drive, I decided to drive around and see if I could find Danny and Lisa's old home. I am driving rather slowly and kind of creepily to see if I can find Danny and Lisa's old home. Sure enough, I spot Danny walking down the street. I am really excited and I flag him down and pull over. He seems kind of stiff, kind of robotic. When I got out and hugged him, he seemed way too tight and felt like he was trying to smother me. I had asked him how he'd been and he said alright. I asked him how Lisa was and where they were and asked if I could see her. He agreed. I asked about all the mutual friends that we had and he seemed kind of confused. Like he didn't remember about 90% of them, which seemed odd. Mainly because Danny was my awesome involved uncle. Being a bit paranoid, I decided to ask him a couple of trick questions. He failed miserably. Now, I'm a bit nervous. We get to his door and he opens it, and the smell hits me like a garbage truck. It smells like a meat locker that had went out of business and they left all the meat inside. The smell literally assaulted my nostrils. The place was a wreck, just crap everywhere. Everything is coated in dust and crap and nothing looks clean. Laundry is everywhere. No lights are on and it's just a mess. Now I'm really freaking out. I ask him, Danny, what's going on here? He just lets out this weird guttural grunt. I asked about Lisa, and I hear a yell coming from the kitchen. The kitchen was just the next room over, and I could hear and smell something cooking. I walked into the kitchen, expecting to see Lisa making some normal food and planning to ask Lisa and Danny what had happened, and why they were acting so weird. But when I walked into the kitchen, I saw something really disturbing. It was unforgettable. Lisa was standing in the kitchen, but she's completely naked, covered in blood and this mangled mess, surrounded by thousands of bones. I was just smart enough to notice a pile of dog collars in the corner. Obviously, being disturbed with what I saw, I let out a yell and Danny lunged at me. I clumsily ran out of the room and out of the house, Danny chasing me the entire way. I made it back to my home and told my parents what had happened. My dad looked like he wanted to punch me in the face. We called the police and the police investigated. They came back and said that no one was in the home, but 
Everything matched about the story I told them. The place was a complete wreck. The police said some BS story that me and my father didn't believe. They told us that maybe some hobos had lived there and they ate the cats and dogs in the neighborhood. Obviously, we didn't believe them and my father asked them why the house had not been foreclosed. They stammered, considering that they knew that we were onto them. And we later found out that Danny's parents actually were paying for the home. But my encounter and my father's story makes everything all the more weird. After my final and last encounter with Danny and Lisa, I finally agree with my parents that I will never go camping again. A couple of years ago, my parents sent me to Norway to live with my grandparents for the summer. I should specify, it wasn't just me, it was also my sister as well, and we obviously did not know the language. My grandparents had a lot of land, and it kind of nestled up into the forest nearby. Obviously, since we didn't know the language, and we weren't too familiar with the land, they didn't want us wandering too far. We were allowed to play anywhere on their land, but we were not allowed to enter the forest. The forest was very dark and dense with trees, and wasn't very appealing for my sister and I. We were in the backyard one day, and my grandma was on the side of the house planting. We were about 10 meters away from the forest, when we heard the sound of a baby crying from the woods. The way it sounded, sounded as if the baby was deep in the woods. My sister and I then looked at one another, confused. Was there some hiking trail that was in the backyard for us that we didn't know about? It definitely wasn't a neighbor, considering that their home was pretty isolated out in the country. Being little and being very gullible, we just thought that there was a baby in the woods that needed our help. For some reason, it didn't cross our minds to ask our grandma about the crying in the woods. We were about to enter the forest when we hear a loud scream behind us. It was our grandmother. We then ran to our grandmother and told her about the crying in the woods, and her face went pale. She then took us inside and made us some lunch. My sister and I were kind of confused. Why didn't our grandmother go and help the baby out in the woods? Why did she react the way she did when we told her about the baby? These questions lingered in my mind. Later that week, my grandmother had to go down to the grocery store while my grandfather was still at work. My sister and I were told to not leave the house and to not answer the door or answer the phone. We did what we were told. About an hour of being by ourselves and watching TV, we hear a loud bang coming from the back door of the house. My sister and I were terrified. We then ran and hid in her grandparents' room. As we were hiding, we noticed that the sounds were then all around the house, and even on the roof. It had to be more than one person, since the sounds were happening all at once. This lasted for about five more minutes, and as quickly as it started, it stopped. Being completely terrified, my sister and I just waited in the bedroom. About an hour later, and our grandparents find us in the bedroom, weeping. We then told them what had happened, and instead of being confused, my grandfather was angry. He then grabs his double barrel shotgun and makes his way out into the woods. My grandmother collects us and brings us into the kitchen and cooks us up some lunch. About 15 minutes into lunch, we hear two loud gunshots coming from the backyard. I then looked up sharply at my grandmother in concern, but my grandmother was acting as if she didn't hear the gunshots. She was old, but her hearing wasn't bad. She definitely heard the gunshots. My grandfather then enters the home. His shirt has splotches of red on it. He quickly removes it and places it in the laundry room and grabs another shirt. Still, my grandmother is still unfazed and pretends as if everything is normal. Before I could ask my grandfather what had happened out in the woods, he turned to me and my sister and said that, I don't want you guys outside anymore. Me being terrified and my sister being oblivious, we both agreed. Not only did he want us to stay inside, but he wanted us to stay away from the windows. 
From that day on, things went from being weird to terrifying. I remember that that evening, my grandfather sat in the living room with his shotgun instead of going to bed early, which he normally did. My grandmother made sure that the blinds were fully drawn on our windows and even went as far as putting a blanket over it to cover them. As an additional precaution, my grandmother also slept in that room with us that evening, but unfortunately, she was known for being such a heavy sleeper. We were reminded once again to not look outside before we went to bed. We promised and we were off to our room with our grandmother. Despite all the tension in the air, I slept pretty well that evening. During the night, however, I thought I heard something soft rub against the wall of the outside of our home that was accompanied by a whimper. For whatever the reason was, I was the first one to wake that morning. Burdened with curiosity, I wanted to check outside to see if there were any tracks left by our nightly visitor. I figured that at that time that the tracks would somehow provide some kind of insight for me that I could better understand what was going on. I made my way slowly to the front door trying not to wake my grandfather, who had fallen asleep in the living room. The door was old and thick with many locks on it that made a lot of clinking sounds, but I made sure to be extra quiet. As I opened the door, light filled the darkened home. I peeked my head out and saw nothing. The coast was clear. I then quickly made my way to the part of the house that I thought I heard someone the night before. That part of the house, however, was at the back of the house. Before I made it to that part of the home, I noticed a red substance on the ground. It was dark and thick, and it seemed to circle the home. It was as if something heavy was being dragged. Something was definitely here last night. As I followed the trail of the red substance, it got thicker and darker and seemed to be leading to the outside part of my room. I turned the corner to see the outside wall of my room, and the sight that laid before me was horrific. I couldn't wrap my head around it at first. There was just so much going on. What was outside my room appeared to be what remained of two horses. Each horse appeared to have what seemed like a gunshot wound to the forehead. I then realized that these horses were probably what my grandfather shot yesterday when he was out in the woods. But what dragged them from the woods to outside my window? Behind the horses on the wall was writing. The writing, unfortunately, was a Norwegian. I then quickly ran inside while also being as quiet as I could so I wouldn't wake anyone in the home. I searched for a pen and paper and when I finally found them, I went back outside to hopefully copy down the words. I copied the words down as best as I could with the little understanding of the Norwegian language. I then quickly ran inside and locked the doors, hiding the piece of paper with the writing on it. My grandfather then woke up about an hour later. Upon waking up, he promptly went outside. He was gone for about two hours, and during that time, my sister and my grandmother were up. When my grandfather returned, instead of being disgusted or frightened, he was happy. He announced that day that everyone was going on a surprise trip to an amusement park. I was really confused. How was it possible that upon seeing those horrific things in the backyard made him want to decide to go on a fun day trip with everyone? It was as if he was celebrating. Upon leaving the house to go to the amusement park, he told us to pack all of our things that we would not be returning. It took us about 30 minutes to do so, and when we did, we took off. As we exited the home, I looked around the house as we left to see if there was any remnants of what happened the night before. It had appeared that my grandfather had cleaned up everything. Anyways, we leave the home and we make our way over to the amusement park and have a great day. The theme park we went to wasn't as great as the ones back in the states, but it was still a lot of fun. A part of me kind of forgets about what happened the night before and what I had written on the piece of paper. We make it back to our parents' house back in the states and we have a great rest of the summer. I forget all about the piece of paper and what I had written on it. 
A couple of years later, I am going through my stuff, and I go through my backpack, and I find the piece of paper. It was about five years later, and I still had not learned any Norwegian. Thankfully enough, my mother speaks Norwegian fluently, so I brought the piece of paper to her and had her read it for me. At the time that I wrote this, a couple years ago, I had not understood all of the letters and all of the words. So my mom was kind of confused at first, trying to read it. She then gets a look on her face as if she understood what it means, and she seems to be disgusted. She then asked me, who gave this to me? I had lied and told her that my friend wrote it as a joke or something. She then smiled and shook her head and said something about losing faith in this generation. She then told me what the piece of paper said. We don't like the taste of horses. We prefer the children. After having my mother read this out loud, she had this look in her eyes as if I unlocked some kind of old ancient memory of hers. She told me that when she was young, her parents would tell her stories of flesh gates. These were old wise tales that my mom thought that were stories to keep her from going out and partying with boys. And for the most part, it worked because the stories were pretty terrifying. Essentially, flesh gates are a lot like skinwalkers. They're able to mimic voices perfectly, and they have the ability to change into any type of animal. I think the day that we were in the backyard and we heard the baby crying, we were very close to being a Flesh Gates' next victim.